Hello? Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of your daily dose of Terraform. My name is Anton Babenko and I'm gonna to talk about Terraform and well and news from Terraform world as well as um, something what I'm kind of excited because you know that Terraform is hard if you do it uh, outside of documentation and specifically it is hard if you want to do it properly. So that's why there are tools, there are different utilities and countless ways of doing the same things. Uh, today we will have special guest uh, from uh, sunny San Francisco. That's why this stream is uh, actually morning for him and uh, evening for Europeans. So uh, uh, before that, let's uh, talk uh, through normal things like uh, what's new in the Terraform world and uh, then I will talk about uh, TerraSpace. TerraSpace is a product by uh, Tung who will join us slightly later. So let's start with this one. Well, not this completely this, but uh, okay. So the first thing is N0. As I told earlier to many of you, N0 is uh, sponsor of this stream. And uh, yeah, and they actually gave me this t-shirt. I think it's quite cool. Uh, but uh, other than printing t-shirts, they also do something with Terraform. And uh, specifically, uh, they develop a platform where you can manage your Terraform configuration files uh, establish different uh, policies and uh, make sure that people are not over provisioning and not wasting a lot of money. So if you are into this, please go to m0.com and slash Anton and then you will see something there. Okay, so now we covered sponsors. Another thing which I want to talk, oh my God, there are so many tabs everywhere as usual. Okay, so the next thing which I want to talk, no, not about TerraSpace yet, but it will be soon. So what's new in Terraform? So Terraform 014 Beta 1 was released and it has a lot of different improvements here and there. I talked about these improvements uh, last week. During this week, there were just new small things added uh, here and there. They're not so relevant uh, for this stream, at least. What I think is quite interesting and I think is quite relevant for many of you guys is that uh, Beta 1 is uh, released and you can actually give it a try on your own, maybe not production uh, infrastructure, but at least, uh, well, I don't see exactly what was. Yeah, this is exactly release notes for Beta 1. Uh, so you can uh, try it and you can see how things work. From my perspective, most of things work and some things which did not work, uh, I have reported and they have been fixed already, but uh, I have not verified. Specifically things which uh, are pretty cool and, uh, and uh, you should be aware is that there will be a file which is called uh, log, log, yes, Terraform will now generate log file in the configuration directory. Most uh, cases you don't have to do anything about it, 
but in some situations you will need to put this into uh, uh, into um, uh, into your git ignore so yes oh yeah of course f2l oll and pll that's a uh, subject of uh, of another video so hello yuri uh, for those who don't know that's uh, um, uh, well that's uh, first two layers uh, oll i forgot and pll is permutation of last layer that's for magic cube uh, well yeah i don't know how to solve magic cube and now i know so that's what I'm uh, practicing when my code is compiling. <clears throat> okay, uh, other things related to Terraform 0.14 uh, release are pretty uh, minor and I don't think you will have to update your code uh, in pretty much any way. Some things related to ignore changes uh, have already landed into VPC module but they are pretty minor and uh, it's quite easy to fix. Okay, so another thing which I want to talk about is about documentation. Well, documentation doesn't work anymore. I mean, documentation works, but search in documentation doesn't work. So yeah, there are 47 people upvoted this post because Google is not indexing Terraform docs for AWS provider anymore. I think it's a big problem uh, because uh, many people like to write AWS VPC endpoint Terraform, at least that's what I was doing, and now it's pointing me, okay, it's pointing me to this module, which is fine, but it doesn't point to documentation. So I, I, if I click on this page, that's what I did actually, it uh, points me to another documentation page, which is a little bit bad and also there are even more people than I anticipated complaining about this search so if you search something here it doesn't work as expected but uh, I'm quite sure that uh, HashiCorp guys know about it the reason why I am showing this uh, and why I'm telling that documentation is not work is that now it's uh, uh, it's kind of moment uh, for this project finally I made it I think about one and a half year ago, maybe even two years ago. And finally, this project is in use. Terraform documentation as PDF. So yes, you can get Terraform documentation for core and for all official providers as PDF. This documentation is updating nightly. And uh, yeah, you can even uh, put it to your Dropbox folder and then it will be in your Dropbox. Uh, so. Finally, there is real use case for this project. I started this project because I needed it myself, but uh, funny enough that I was not using it myself uh, so much as I expected, because I'm always, almost always online and I can use internet to search. But if you are offline or if uh, official documentation doesn't work, then at least you can get, you can get it from uh, this PDF. So. Hopefully there will be more stars here and more people will find it useful. Okay, so the next uh, thing is, well, I have this note, but I don't know what is this note actually about because it's from previous episode. So let's go. Oh, right, scaffold. Create an AWS infrastructure defined as code in second. Sounds cool, but NPM? Hmm, no, please. Who is scaffold for? Well, developers, startups, so it's it's like everyone. Okay, so uh, the the way how they uh, treat it is is not very unique, but their pricing is uh, rather unique. So you pay per components from their catalog. Their catalog is very small right now. Maybe they will expand it. Uh, the code which is generated by this tool is not very optimal to my opinion, but uh, I think they are just starting. So if you are like, if you want to give it a try, you can take a look and maybe you find it useful. Uh, this company is not competing with Grantworks in any way, but I think they use similar colors. Well, anyway, these colors are pretty much everywhere, including Waypoint. 
So the next thing uh, which I want to mention, and I think I have to mention this now because this is just insanely cool. These guys, uh, Andreas and Michael Wittig, are very well known guys from uh, AWS uh, cloud formation community. And uh, since they decided to focus on uh, uh, creating content, they started a uh, project or not project. This is their new business, which is called Cloud on Out Plus. It's not publicly available yet. It will be publicly available from 2nd of November. And what it, what it actually is about. Uh, these guys know a lot about AWS, like literally a lot, a lot. It's like, I don't know, it's definitely uh, top five guys uh, in, in the whole world when it comes to AWS. And uh, what they want to do is that they want to provide a, a platform where uh, everyone can access their community portal and everyone can uh, pay fixed price to get access to their video. So, for example, videos which they publish are usually um, on very specific content, which you most likely will not be able to find anywhere on Internet. So what, uh, what it means is that they do a lot of uh, research work. They talk a lot to different customers and then they figure out, oh, okay, so now we want to make video explaining how, for example, replace IAM users with AWS SSO, which is pretty cool. Uh, I personally found very useful video from them when they talked about how to get information about API calls, uh, which uh, system makes but they are not reporting into CloudTrail. So they made a video about it and uh, you can, if you pay $15 a month, you have access to all of the archive and all of the materials which are going to be published. They're going to publish it uh, quite frequently. Uh, I don't know, maybe weekly, not daily, but at least weekly. Yeah, weekly content or online event with practical examples. So highly recommend to spend 15 euros a month on these guys because they know what is it very well. And they also develop a lot of cool projects. As I said, they're very well known in AWS and CloudFormation communities. So they also use Terraform. So good job. Okay, uh, moving to the next thing. Uh, this week I gave two interviews which are rather different, but at the same time, they're both for Ukrainian uh, people. So, I mean, for Ukrainian interviewers. Uh, Proof My Concept by Denis Vasiliev was a uh, rather interesting uh, experience because uh, there I talked about uh, uh, general things and uh, some things were not related to, uh, to things which you usually hear from me here on this stream. Um, so. You can check this out and, of course, subscribe to his channels and his podcast. Uh, he's doing this quite regularly as well. And yesterday I gave an interview to this uh, organization, which is called Committed. A uh, few minutes before this podcast, I discovered this funny ad at the top where Azure DevOps enables you to build tests and blah, blah, blah. And the funny thing is that uh, I was talking about AWS and Terraform and Azure here. So I think it's kind of hilarious because uh, Azure uh, is not something what I work daily, but they are uh, actually visible as a sponsor of this uh, event, which is okay for me. I can talk about anything really. Uh, during this event, I revealed some interesting points related to projects which I'm working and uh, specifically Module CF. So if you, if you don't want to talk about just Terraform, uh, but want to know more about that, uh, you can hear about that uh, on this stream. Uh, okay, so the next uh, thing, uh, well, there are so many things before we can even go to TerraSpace today. So here is, uh, again, uh, it's, it's so funny, is that uh, it's probably uh, episode number five in a row when I have to mention something cool, which uh, educational team within HashiCorp is producing. And our guest today has the same last name and very similar first name, but it's not him. So uh, uh, today 
I want to highlight these two tutorials which were published by educational team. The cool part here is that uh, Terraform, uh, Terraform workflows and how to run Terraform workflows on uh, GitHub or on uh, different CI systems is pretty hot. And uh, I've been asked this myself pretty much yesterday. And uh, I honestly said that I don't know how to do this because there are so many ways, so many dependencies. I can give general information, but then I will customize it to specific use case every time. Here they described, uh, for example, if we look into GitHub Actions, here they described how this process should be looking, like in general. Don't pay attention that they mentioned Terraform Cloud here pretty much everywhere. Uh, well, 28 times is not everywhere, but they mentioned Word, Word Space, I guess not fewer times, yes, 15 times. So Terraform uh, Cloud and Workspaces are entirely optional. The key information which I want to uh, uh, kind of highlight here is that here they described how you can do this. Uh, well, you can skip this part if you're not into Terraform Cloud, but how you can actually set up your GitHub repository and specifically how you have to write your .github workflow Terraform YAML config file, which actually defines the GitHub action workflow. So it's pretty uh, detailed and there are a couple diagrams showing it, uh, how you can do this. Uh, if you are starting with running Terraform in any automated tools uh, or in any automated fashion, uh, I would really recommend to look into this one because it actually explains steps and it explains uh, which commands you have to run or you can run. Uh, we already have similar project in progress uh, for Terraform AWS modules where we also use uh, GitHub Actions and uh, we will make sure that uh, uh, we, we kind of uh, explain this uh, maybe next week uh, if it will be visible. So stay tuned for that. And the uh, code which they described is already here and you can just, you can just use it. It's pretty cool. Okay, so a bunch of different things here. And then you can probably remember how Atlantis work. You click show plan and then you see uh, the whole uh, plan here pasted. Well, you see a lot of boring stuff, but in 014 you will see less stuff. So it's pretty interesting way. And the same they do for, uh, for Circle CI. Okay, uh, the last thing which I want to mention before going to TerraSpace is about uh, TF Lint. Right. Uh, I want to make it uh, kind of uh, clear and I want to uh, release an interview with a developer of, uh, uh, of TF Lint, which I recorded, well, not recorded, but synthesized and recorded. Um, but uh, I, I still cannot do this. So I, I really want to share it with everyone, but uh, I couldn't get hold of uh, Kazuma yet. So it's still uh, kind of uh, not available for everyone, but I think it's pretty cool. Um, okay, so yeah, and uh, the very last thing which I just discovered five minutes before stream is that uh, there will be a live stream uh, event sometime on, uh, when is it? Well, when is it? Well, next week. Yeah, I think it's on Tuesday. So on Tuesday, we will be talking together with Marcia, uh, uh, who is uh, AWS developer advocate. Uh, we will be talking about Terraform and serverless, and it will be live Q&A. So we will also do some live coding, of course, because, uh, I mean, Terraform is just uh, made uh, for live coding. <laughs> you, you make something live, and then you run it, and then it fails, and then you fix it. I think it's pretty cool. So if you are into serverless and Terraform, please make sure to uh, uh, to join this uh, event and mm, yeah, and bring your questions about serverless because I have not been talking about serverless.tf for quite a long time. So now let's move on to to TerraSpace. TerraSpace is amazing. I'm not kidding. It's amazing by many criteria. So where should I start? 
Yes, okay, let's start with creator, Tung. So Tung is the founder of organization Bolt Ops consultant company focused on AWS. And uh, he is also AWS community hero focusing on containers. Uh, what it means is that he has a lot of videos. He has a lot of videos on YouTube where he talk about all his projects. And now you will understand why he's doing so many projects. I, I have been uh, discussing with him a few things here and there. Uh, I can just tell you that uh, he's pretty unusual guy because uh, as often with technologies, you start uh, when you need to fix something, you just uh, start working on it in the easiest uh, way possible. So you pick technologies which you already knew from the past and then you somehow connect them together and then you think that uh, it's good enough. So you kind of uh, uh, employ your previous knowledge and try to build something uh, what is better than before. That's exactly what is happening uh, with, uh, uh, with, um, uh, with <laughs> this guy, with Tung, uh, because uh, his experience in Ruby is, is insane. And uh, amount of projects, let me just show amount of projects, uh, which he has been developing, and you will understand what I mean. Well, he has actually a homepage, I think it uh, homepage lists even more projects, but uh, mm, let's see, uh, just uh, not sure what it means, not much views, unfortunately. Um, Azure, Azure DevOps like build platform. Not much views, unfortunately. Well, that's problem probably of Azure DevOps. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I don't know uh, what is the problem uh, with Azure DevOps and Klondike of knowledge. Yes, he is. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's go back. So yes, he is creator of TerraSpace, which we're gonna to talk about. Uh, Jets, Lona, Cubes, UFO, Cody, and probably something more because it just doesn't fit into this uh, sequence. Uh, all right, yes, exactly. So uh, the comment from Maxim was about amount of views. Yeah, that's just unfortunate. Uh, guys, please subscribe to his channel and uh, I'm sure that you will learn uh, just, I don't know, about anything. SQS queues with CloudFormation, here you go. Uh, like I, I clicked on some uh, uh, like Lono uh, CloudFormation framework because there are 20,000 uh, CloudFormation frameworks, but no, there is 20,001 because uh, Tung uh, has created one. And uh, in general, yes, you're absolutely right. He, he has created a bunch of different things. So uh, yeah, he has created Lono, UFO because ECS is hot and uh, of course, uh, uh, yeah, of course, the, there are missing tools uh, everywhere. So yeah, he, he has developed a bunch of things. Uh, so yeah, make sure to subscribe and to follow him. He has uh, projects and he has uh, GitHub and Twitter as well. So uh, overall, uh, when, you, when I first go to his profile page, I see, okay, Ruby, Ruby, Ruby everywhere. So I was a little bit skeptical at the beginning, because I know that uh, usually if there is a programming language, then people will do everything using this programming language. And when it comes to my experience with Ruby, I was actually developing in Ruby when Ruby on Rails started in about 2006 or seven, I don't remember. And uh, when you have Ruby, your hands automatically start writing framework. It doesn't matter what you want to do, whether you want to do it or not. If there is Ruby, there will be framework. So that's uh, pretty interesting. I, I thought like, okay, so this guy does a lot. And then I saw Jets. I think Jets I've heard actually before, because uh, when you hear about these projects and you scroll and then you see Ruby and Lambda, it's like, hmm, okay, uh, Ruby is not very popular language among uh, many uh, tools right now. 
I mean, it's it just uh, usually treated as something from the last century. And uh, when you see modern uh, modern uh, technologies and modern uh, development uh, techniques like serverless and AWS Lambda, and then you combine it with uh, Ruby, uh, this project usually quite uh, quite provocative, at least. So uh, uh, that's pretty much it about uh, Tung. Just make sure that you follow all of his projects. So now let's talk about what is actually TerraSpace. TerraSpace is one of uh, his projects and uh, TerraSpace uh, definition is, okay, Terraform project. Well, uh, of course, uh, as you probably know, uh, my previous experience with, uh, with uh, TerraGrant is that uh, I'm pretty well aware about uh, cases when Terraform is not good fit or when Terraform should be replaced with something bigger and something more flexible. And uh, that's why I was using uh, TerraGrant uh, for quite a long time and I saw how it's beneficial. So when I look into uh, TerraSpace and when I talk to uh, the creator for the first time, pretty much instant question was, so what's your opinion on uh, TerraGrant? And uh, from my experience uh, of using uh, TerraSpace for a limited amount of time, uh, it's actually not a replacement for TerraGrant. It's doing things slightly different. So uh, in a nutshell, uh, TerraSpace, well, uh, there are a lot of different introduction videos, which I encourage you to check. But uh, I will just tell uh, very uh, like small things uh, about the workflow. So uh, TerraSpace is not replacing or is not doing anything extra than providing you an uh, uh, let's say an opinionated structure for your infrastructure repository and let you to bring up infrastructure or bring down some infrastructure. Um, so that's pretty much uh, the main idea of TerraSpace. So it will literally generate code uh, or it will not generate, but it will enhance Terraform code, put it into a specific location and then it will run Terraform commands there. Sounds pretty much the same way as you may imagine about TerraGrant. The only difference is that TerraGrant does a little bit more magic uh, behind, for example, when it comes to passing uh, variables, um, so passing variables uh, to, to that project. Uh, TerraGrant does it through environment variables. Here it's implemented slightly different. And uh, in, in general, they do pretty similar things from user perspective, I would say. But uh, TerraSpace is very new, is pretty much uh, like, um, how to say, not the first project, but uh, it doesn't have any legacy other than Ruby in it. So there is a question with the depends on for modules resolved with Terraform 0. 13 does Terragrant still sends to be used? Yes, it does. Uh, I mean, Terragrant is still necessary and it is necessary for the situations uh, when you actually want to uh, to control what you want to do. Let's say if you use depends on and you have uh, configurations in one big, uh, let's say in one main TF file and you invoke many different modules. That's good that you can rely on depends on. If it works, then it's great. But uh, in most cases, you don't want to, to manage all infrastructure as a whole. You want to be much more robust and work on specific subset of infrastructure resources. Uh, so that's why uh, TerraGrant is still doing something differently, uh, which Terraform 0, uh, 13 or 14 or 15 will not be able to cope with. And uh, yeah, and still uh, principles of uh, don't repeat yourself are implemented in TerraGrant and there are no direct intentions for Terraform to make this life easier, honestly. I mean, maybe there are some plans in someone's head, but I don't see them uh, discussed anywhere. So we'll see, we'll see. Okay, cool. So uh, now let's go to the code because 
I was told that you guys like to see some code. Is it true? Or do you want to see some PowerPoint presentation? Okay, let me close some files because they're not relevant. And here is this. So here is uh, this project. Yes, okay. Let me just close some files. Mm. Uh, yes. So here is this project structure. Uh, I will just collapse it a little bit to, to show it. So TerraSpace example. Uh, so the way how I started it, or actually let me explain what I will, uh, what I will talk and what uh, Tung will talk about. Uh, so the first thing which I want to show, uh, I will just talk about structure of the project and uh, how uh, how I used TerraSpace and what it gave to me. There are pretty much significant amount of features and add-ons already inside of TerraSpace, which are really cool. And uh, I will ask Tung to show uh, them in details and actually he will be able to answer your questions. So please... Uh, uh, think about what is uh, like what do you th w want to know or if there are any hot things which you just couldn't solve with Terraform or TerraGrant and you want to know if it is possible to solve with TerraSpace and how please uh, let me know in the chat okay so the first thing which uh, I want to do is that I run command which was well what was the command the command which I run, hmm. well, the command was uh, which I run. It generated, uh, uh, it just generated uh, project. So the project uh, is called infra, and then it generated uh, app and config folders. So these two folders are mm, like pretty self-explained, I would say. Uh, there is not much to do inside of config in uh, in config folder, but uh, inside of app folder we can see that there are two folders already. There are modules and there are stacks. And uh, some of you, I know, I actually assume that some people uh, who work with me on different project now see this and they think like, oh yeah, that's what we told you that we want to use in Terraform code because people want uh, to have separation between modules and places where configuration for these modules lives. That's why uh, we always have separation, like we use TerraGrant and then we use TerraGrant HCL where we just contain key values which we want to use. So here is similar concept. We have stacks. So stacks is like uh, your stack is called demo and then inside of demo you have full place where you write your Terraform code. So literally, this is how you describe your resources. In this case, it's going to use module bucket, which is located in a local folder. But of course, it can be any Git repository here or anything else. So think about this demo folder as something where you put your Terraform configuration literally 100%. There is no, uh, no limitations, no constraint for you what to do there. And of course, naming can be customized the way you want. Uh, yeah, so there are some questions about uh, this. I will try to answer uh, as we go along. So talking about uh, this folder is really important to understand that there are no limitations what you put here. So here we resource random path and bucket. And this bucket uh, is the only thing which we want to create. We, of course, have outputs, we have some variables, so that's pretty straightforward. And then we have another folder which is called modules. This is just an example of how this uh, uh, module can be created. So we, that's an example of local module, but we can use remote uh, from registry, from anything. Again, uh, in these two folders, there are no limitations which TerraSpace imply or TerraSpace uh, require you to follow a certain instruction. So then after this, there is a folder called config terraform. And you can see backend and provider TF. Uh, as you can guess what kind of stuff you can put here. Again, it's uh, just convention that there is file called provider TF. You can put anywhere, anything you want. And then there is file backend. 
And this is where interesting parts start to happen. So this file is actually embedding Ruby templates and uh, I, can, I can almost hear some people say, foo, this is Ruby, why we should mix these technologies? So please uh, uh, be quiet and don't, uh, don't produce unnecessary noise until you see how it is actually used. So here is function uh, which is called expansion is used and uh, there you can see favorite or not favorite but Ruby syntax column account and column region column env. These uh, variables will be expanded into something and uh, again uh, if you know uh, how it's done in Teragrant that's pretty much the same stuff. Teragrant use its own uh, functions written in Go. Here it's using the same logic with uh, replacement but written in Ruby. So that's fine. And uh, then we have provider where we can define some provider configuration, but it's not necessary. It's just optional. So now we have to do something, right? How to execute it? Well, that's where a lot of interesting uh, innovation, I would say, is starting to happen. The first one is when we look into a command which is called I'm not familiar with commands yet, but a uh, command called build, TerraSpace build. Uh, hopefully it will work because uh, it may... Yes, okay, cool. Now it's actually working as expected. So it says that building uh, one stack and if I go to TerraSpace, well, there is column info. TerraSpace info demo, demo is name of the stack. And there I can see where uh, build directory is, where cache directory, names, and so on. So here I can see that uh, cache dir is the one which is actually containing all of this information. So here I can go to stack, and then stacks demo is actually going to be executed. As you can see, these files are copied from... Uh, parent configuration because uh, they define how backend will be uh, described and provider configuration and then we have main outputs and variables again if you know how teragram works there should be zero surprises to you so far because that's exactly behavior of teragram uh, i think teragram had it since version 0 0.1 in 2016 so it's the same behavior nothing new here but uh, uh, what is already interesting here is that backend configuration is already replaced. So this information is my account number, uh, which I use for this. And this one is also um, replaced because that's how, that's how it was uh, designed. So what I do now is that I, I have actually a code created inside of stack demo. And uh, uh, what I can do next is that I can actually create this stuff by running well by running up demo so up and the name of stack uh, I have already created this infrastructure before and as you can see the whole folder stack demo actually self-containing so if you are dreaming about using uh, Terragram and run it on uh, Terraform cloud but you couldn't because Terragram does m some magic which uh, is not natively supported by Terraform and you cannot just uh, replace 100% of Terragram with Terraform. So then TerraSpace actually does no magic in terms of uh, setting variables and passing values from module to resources. And uh, as I said, you can just commit this folder and uh, run it through Terraform Cloud natively. It's, uh, it's kind of supported out of the box. So yeah, now I run Terraform or sorry, TerraSpace up demo. And as you can see, uh, it also uh, built the same code, uh, which, which I built before, but uh, anyway, it rebuilt it. And then it ran Terraform apply and input false because it doesn't want me to prompt for inputs. And uh, cool part here, uh, which I don't know if it is uh, visible or not. Well, it's it's scrolled before, so I cannot see. But uh, logs from this uh, from this view 
or from uh, running different Terraform init commands are usually polluted with a lot of information and we don't need to see all of that information. So what TerraSpace is doing is that uh, it hides a lot of logs which are unnecessary for you to see, but uh, you can always uh, find them. Uh, they are written somewhere in files like this. So uh, in temporary location, you can see logs in there. So, which is pretty cool. So you actually get uh, most of uh, Terraform and uh, adding uh, like some requirements and some uh, extra features which Terraform cannot give to you uh, is, for me, is pretty cool. Again, as I said many times before, is that I believe that this kind of orchestration should belong to Terraform in first place. But uh, I don't see this happening and I don't think that most of HashiCorp employees agree to me because uh, there are no uh, direct intention to look around and say, okay, from now on, we will make Terraform and then uh, let's say up with dependencies, for example. I mean, there is no such comment, but if there would be such comment, uh, then this uh, comment should run uh, the same things what I just did with TerraSpace app demo. So, uh, yeah, we'll see how, how it goes with the Terraform. But if we are talking about just uh, TerraSpace today, uh, then I think it's definitely on the right direction. And also, if I uh, mentioned for how long time this project has been in development, you will be pretty much surprised. I think it's a couple months. So, well, two months of work and uh, it's time already to to show to people and ask for feedback and ask for different uh, like uh, uh, like how people uh, feel about it other than it's written in ruby um, so yeah it's it's good time okay let me uh, uh, focus on the last thing which i want to show before talking to before talking to tung so here is another command which is pretty cool. Terra space up, or sorry, all graph. Um, so if I run this command now, you will laugh. Well, yeah, actually you will not see it. Right, you will not see because it. So what, what it did, <laughs> it's kind of funny. It uh, visualized my infrastructure relations and uh, I will just show it in the browser. <clears throat> how exactly it did so TerraSpace graph so dependency graph if you know what is uh, apply all plan all and validate all in TerraGrant uh, that was the whole inspiration for this uh, for this solution as well so TerraSpace support deployment of dependent stacks too so you can deploy multiple stacks it's already pretty well documented and you can take a look on how it's done. What I just run uh, in uh, ID actually generated this kind of graph to me. But since I have only one stack, there were no errors. There were mm, just one. No, so there was just one box without any errors, which is pretty useless to see. But when you have a lot of relations like this one where C1 is dependent uh, uh, on uh, B, B2, B1, and A2, I think it's pretty cool. And imagine that you have actually uh, real names of stacks here, not just uh, keys, but actually real names. You should be able to understand what is dependency graph and, and how it uh, will behave. You can also visualize part of your graph. So for example, here you can visualize uh, just uh, targeted subgraph um, which includes A2 and B2. So that's that's why uh, A2 and B2 are included into this graph and that's uh, visualized. And yeah, you can also do the same command uh, run Terra space up. Uh, if you write Terra space up and then name of the stage, you will spin up just one environment. But if you write TerraSpace all up, which is a little bit confusing, uh, you will see actually more information. 
So a uh, uh, question uh, which is quite re relevant already um, by Maxim. Uh, what is the difference from Terraform graph uh, when we output into SVG? Well, there are two uh, things. Uh, Terraform does uh, not work with uh, sub, uh, like outside of this folder, it will not be able to visualize. Here, all of your, uh, all of your, um, stacks uh, physically live in different uh, directories so they have different state files and they are pretty independent from each other um, so T terraform uh, graph can do this only inside of one folder inside of one state file and uh, this is one thing and also a terraform graph uh, output significantly more information, which in most cases is unnecessary. And uh, if you run this command on anything more than hello world, uh, you most likely saw how useless that output is. It's easy to impress people and uh, it sometimes, especially in early days, helped uh, us to understand how this dependency graph is supposed to work and what is dependency on what. But nowadays, uh, I don't think it's producing a lot of values because it just, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's not necessary. Okay, and the last question, which I think I, I can answer, uh, please share some information on how to use template rendering. Well, no, sorry, I cannot answer this question. So we need to ask for expert help. So let me ask expert. Just let me see where is our expert. Our expert is here. No. Yeah. So where is our expert? Tung, are you still with us? Yes, I'm still with you. Cool. Uh, so yes, we can hear you. Can you enable your video? Because... Oh, that might be useful. Yeah. <laughs> uh, where is no, 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 that's me sharing my desktop. Hmm. Yeah, let me figure this out real quick. Start video. Do you see me? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, we, we can see you and hear you. Cool. So yeah, just uh, some things. Well, there are so many interesting questions from people. That's pretty cool. Uh, I don't think uh, I have received so many questions when I uh, talked about Terragrant because Terragrant is well known and people were like, oh yeah, what, what new can you tell us? And now we have you. So <laughs> uh, let's get started. Uh, just when people uh, are coming up with different questions, uh, can can you explain a little bit about uh, how you start this project? Because it, uh, it, it's hilarious. <laughs> uh, sure. So um, I run a consultancy company. So I do work for uh, different people, and. Uh, I had a project that come up and was like, okay, I need to use something like Terraform in order to solve this, uh, this specific issue for this project. So I was like, okay, finally, I'm going to start taking a look at what the rest of the world has been looking at Terraform because I've been actually doing a lot more cloud formation and uh, some of these other tools that you kind of cover, which that, that was cool, thanks. Um, so I started uh, playing with Terraform a little bit. And uh, just like most people, uh, what I do is uh, I go on Google, <laughs> I search for, uh, you know, Terraform and how to use it and then different tools. Uh, then I started playing around with it and I just, yeah, some of the tools out there, you mentioned some of them already, they just, it, it didn't feel, it didn't fit right for what I was trying to do. So um, I was just like, you know, do I have to go through this pain, you know, and all that? And, and so I was like, no, there's got to be a better way. And so I kept it that for actually a bit. And then I was like, okay, well, I've actually built some of these tools already. I think I need some, you know, I think I know what I need. So I'll just try, try to start building it, right? And so, and, and I'm, so I usually don't like go off. I just want to explain that context because I don't go off and go, okay, let's go build a tool just for the sake of building tools, even though I enjoy it. I build for specific uses usually uh, for whatever problem I'm trying to solve specifically, like real world problems. And then, uh, and then I usually actually try to not do the work uh, and then sometimes I actually do use other tools. I definitely, you're a DevOps guy, so you have to use a variety of different tools in real life. So then I will usually use some other tool, and then I will usually sometimes even fork it 
and then modify it to my needs, uh, then hope, you know, pray to the uh, merge gods that they might merge their pull request back in. Um, or, but then what eventually kind of happens, I've seen this pattern kind of repeat it, mm-hmm. is it doesn't do exactly what I need to do. It's just that a little annoying bit, you know? And then you know, I just got, okay, I'm just going to write a, a tool that does exactly what I need it to do. So that's kind of how the, the origin story, I guess, of TerraSpace. I, I started working on Terraform because I, I had to do it for a project, for a specific project. And then after that, I was like, okay, I just need the tool to do what I need it to do. So that's when I started kind of working on it. And then one of my buddies actually was working with me during this project, right? Because uh, I work with other folks and he was like, so you're going to go create this tool, huh? <laughs> uh, and, and like, I think he was a little bit like, um, mm, I, I would say like, it was like some big kind of tax, right? And I was like, no, 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 I, I've done a lot of th- these different tools before. So I think I kind of uh, have a decent handle. So I, I started working on it and then he literally saw it from mm-hmm. like, like not existing to like being created. And he was like, and he gave me really good feedback. So I've been working with him and he's just like, oh, maybe you should, you know, change this folder to this, this. And then I've been kind of incorporating like most, mm-hmm. not all, but most of the feedback. And then, uh, so I kind of been building out that way. And then he was just like, Tom, I think you've kind of internalized how to build these type of tools from doing it for so long that you just have kind of like some of the patterns down. So I think this is actually an aggregation. I'm kind of proud of this work mm. of kind of a variety of different tools. Like you mentioned another tool I wrote called Lono. It was a cloud formation framework. That's actually 10 years old, mm. right? UFO itself is actually like eight years old or something. Uh, all these other tools. And what I did was I try to uh, grab the best ideas and concepts and then just kind of apply it back over. And that's why, you know, you kind of mentioned like, oh, this is actually quite young, but it, it, it's quite young based on some kind of knowledge that just, I think you can beam into your brain long enough. Eventually mm-hmm. that knowledge is like, it's stuck in your brain. You're like, okay, so I know not to do this. I need <laughs> to do this. And so that's kind of the evolution, I guess, the origin story of Terra Space. Hopefully that was helpful. Um, yeah, I felt like I kind of went on a couple of tangents there. Yeah, but that, that's really cool to know. Uh, I mean, 10 years ago, come on, Cloud Formation was just released 10 years ago. So, yeah, that's uh, it's pretty interesting yeah. because my, my experience with Cloud Formation and people who use Cloud Formation is that pretty much instantly they figure out that uh, there is need to, to do something. Spectre, Fog, whatever else uh, people come up with was uh, created to simplify work around that. And uh, from my experience, people who use Terraform are almost never uh, come up with anything more complicated or sophisticated than collection of shell scripts with just uh, here and there do some ad hoc things. I have m- made my collection of ad hoc uh, shell script myself and then I figured out that I'm probably not doing something right. And then it was pretty much the same time when Terragrant started. So I started using it very early on. And uh, now I see that uh, you have uh, kind of uh, looked at this field one more time, because uh, as I understand, you did not look into Terragrant before, right? Uh, no, no, I didn't look at much at Terragrant or Terraform before, like maybe mm. six months ago, like you asked me some questions about this. I'd be like, oh, I'm not very knowledgeable about that area, you know? be honest like right. maybe ask you know maybe ask anton <laughs> <laughs> now, now, now i know that uh you've written basically every single AWS module in the world uh not all of them but uh, wow like pre- pretty crazy stuff and and, and we can kind of cover some some of that here hmm. but uh yeah um hmm. i'm actually relatively new to the terraform space so that uh in, in some ways right uh that might be a disadvantage but in another way that actually might be a very advantageous because this is a fresh perspective usually uh, and I find this, like when I'm coding or doing anything, sometimes I'm just like, you know what? Maybe it's just time to walk away for today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I should walk away, go for a walk, come back, wake up refreshed, and yeah. then I'll maybe be able to solve this problem, right? Yeah. And, and that, that actually, like, even though maybe as, you know, humans, we don't like to admit this, mm. but sometimes like, that's the best thing to do for yourself. Like, yeah. you know, just walk away and like come back with some fresh eyes. And then all of a sudden things kind of, there's more clarity. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, pretty cool uh, information to know. Like, uh, I'm gonna to read a couple questions from people because uh, people are asking large amount of questions. So let me start from uh, like from the oldest one, which I have already read. I will move myself to the side. So 
Please share some information on how to use template rendering. I guess, uh, uh, well, I don't know how we can do this. Can you share your screen, maybe? Yeah, I can share my screen. And, I, I think it's shared already, but um, we're at the share within a share, so we have to kind of go... Um, unshare. Unshare. We have to go meta, I guess. Oh, I have to unshare now? Oh, let me try to unshare uh, well, uh, No, I think, uh, I think I'm fine, so you can just share it. So yeah. let's share. Hopefully you can see uh, yeah, yeah. my desktop. With, yeah, uh, we can see. File nine. Okay, sweet. Oh, okay, cool. And then, yeah, I can show uh, uh, essentially ERB rendering. And there's some trade-offs with everything. I, I found in the real world, there are trade-offs. There's no, like, elixir. There's no, you know, cure-all for, for your, your, your problems, usually. Um, uh, so, yeah, I'll answer that ERB thing. And then uh, uh, I just kind of had a thought. You kind of mentioned... The, uh, what you've seen by most people is they do like bash scripts to glue things together, right? Because that's what DevOps is, kind of like bash is the glue of DevOps, right? You, you just use this and you kind of like, you patch things together, kind of get it working, right? Yep. And you say maybe you kind of said maybe I, I'm doing it wrong. I actually don't think you're doing it wrong. I think it's fine. I think that's how most people do it. But the context and perspective here is, uh, you know, most people when they're solving a problem, they're they're on a job, right? They have a company, they work for the company, and then they have to solve that job for that specific company, right? Mm -hmm. And they have to do it with deadlines and timelines and everything. I have to do that too, right? However, the one difference between maybe uh, me, Bull Ops, and maybe like even like Terra Grunt, right? Uh, and, it, and people solving this problem with their bash scripts and the, all the glue is they have to solve it for one company, right? Mm -hmm. We have to repeatedly solve this problem over and over and over, right? And we have to solve it for multiple companies. So it's just very natural for, for somebody who's in consultancy come in situation to uh, kind of more abstract that out, right? Yeah. So uh, so that's how why I'm like, do I really want to copy the same bash, you know, script, shell scripts everywhere here? And like, you know, I do that too. Everybody does that, you know? Like everybody says copy and paste is evil, but like sometimes <laughs> you copy and paste, right? So uh, so that's why usually it does start off for me, to, to be honest, it starts off with a bash script for me too. Uh, most of the things I start off is like, it's a bash script, that's all I need. And then I start abstracting out, and then I extract out the concrete parts. Because I'm not like most people, or I guess some people, like maybe professors, they're really good at starting off with the abstract concept and then going to concrete kind of implementation. I, my brain hasn't kind of worked that way. My brain is like, I need like concrete use cases, and I start from there, then I abstract out to the patterns. Mm. So that's why you kind of see what, what you see. But anyway, so to answer the ERB question, you see my screen, right? Yep. So I'll, I'll do a quick demo. And then in there, I'll basically hopefully answer this ERB question. But anyway, so I'm going to go TerraSpace new uh, project, Infra Examples. And that generates that project. So this is essentially what you are showed. I was uh, keeping up uh, uh, in and out there uh, earlier uh, when you were talking on the YouTube stream. But you see this on the left-hand side here. What it did was it created basically all these folder structures, right? So it basically created a starter like project uh, with uh, these files. And what I'm kind of go do now is I'm gonna go kind of uh, show how ERB templating kind of works, right? So, and, and you do a, a good job of explaining it. Essentially these files in here, like the app modules, stack modules, and the big Terraform, these are the kind of this, and this gets combined together. And then that basically builds a Terraform project and then at that point after that, it's pure Terraform. It's actually not TerraSpace, it's just pure Terraform, right? Terra, TerraSpace does some extra, you know, help being logic, some convenience things like automatically creating the S3 bucket and all those things, right? And possibly running hooks and, and all those things. But at, after generating the project and piling this project down essentially, uh, or materializing the project, however you want to call it, then you have pure Terraform, okay? And in here, you basically could do anything. You could do anything with ERB. So the templating language, uh, I didn't invent my own template language. Um, nope, I just used whatever was available in, the, in this in this case, the Ruby ecosystem. So this will actually maybe explain it a little bit. You go to here, docs, uh, config, mm, bars, how about intro, how Terraform works. ERB templating, right? So uh, HCL ERB templating. So, at the end of the day, you're going to be working with HCL files. This is just like, this is just plain old HCL, right? But if you wanted to, you could use ERB templating. And basically, it says it right here. Basically, a very minor enhancement that TerraSpace does is it processes each of the TF, TF files right here within this, these folders with ERB. 
So ERB is just like a template language that looks something like this, time.now, okay? And I'll just do it with a comment. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go CV into the infra, terra space build. And then what you're gonna see is it generates this file right here and you kind of showed off the command earlier, demo, right? So there's a demo and the path is uh, right here, right? So you can actually, I'm not gonna see it into there, but I'm a cat. Basically, uh, oh, did I save this? Oh, it looks like this dot wasn't saved. So I gotta save that again, and let's try rebuilding. So I'm gonna rebuild there, okay? And then you're going to uh, maybe, I'm gonna cat this guy now. So I'm gonna cat, uh, and this was what? This was the stack. So I'm gonna go ahead and cat the stack, okay? And this was main.tf. See this timestamp that was added with ERB right here. So in a way, you can actually, because ERB is actually just plain old Ruby, uh, with, the, with the view part, you can actually use any programming construct now, right? You, you, like, even though the docs don't really emphasize that that you have the full power of programming language behind the scenes, because I actually think, for the most part, uh, because most people are going to be used to HCL, you should generally stick to HCL, I think, particularly in modules. Maybe yeah. in stacks, you use some HCL there, and then maybe in TFR files, uh, you can use, actually, you can use also... Uh, uh, ERB and the full programming language power of, uh, of a full programming language. So you can do things like normal loops, you know. Um, let me, I just, I just, I just do this. Like, yeah, it's pretty cool. Create. It's pretty cool to see a uh, possibility to uh, extend functionality which can be naturally implemented inside of Terraform using uh, ERB or I was using Jinja for that many times. Uh, yeah, Python, Jinja, yeah. uh, and the, Go the, template, the Go templating language, right? Yeah, um, and the, the point is that uh, Terraform does not have this feature, but I need to do something about it. So the most uh, like recommended way, at least recommended by me, uh, is to use JSONnet. Uh, so then you can generate uh, JSON templates from the uh, JSONnet, uh, uh, so JSON file from JSONnet templates and uh, once you familiarize yourself with uh, language, it's quite powerful. Uh, here you do similar things. That's pretty cool. Yeah, 100%. And, and JSONnet, I saw people doing that too with Terraform, but also in Kubernetes were a lot yeah. with JSONnet. And for some reason, that, that seemed to have taken off also. Um, I thought it just didn't fit right for my brain. Just may, Maybe it's just JavaScript. I, I feel like it's a little bit too loose of language. Uh, I mean... Because for what's worth, Ruby is actually a dynamic language too, it's interpreted language. Yep. But uh, I think Ruby, I would say it's dynamic. JavaScript, I would say it's loose, right? So loosely typed versus dynamically typed, right? And loosely typed is like, loosely typed means like stuff like this works, right? Like yeah. one plus one, right? Oh, yeah. that's gonna equal 11 <laughs> string, right? That's like loosely typed, right? So yeah. I'm just like, uh, a little bit like, a little bit too loose for me, right? But dynamic, I feel like gives you the right amount of glue to mm. to build things like this um, yeah but the, the but point know, the main point of uh, using JSONnet is that terraform natively accept json so yes yes it can so so there's a part here that i didn't i don't emphasize too much but actually terra space can do this also uh, i just don't spend a lot of time yet because mm. i think the hcl uh, uh people are more used to hcl and i i, I, I yeah. want to get better hcl myself but uh you could actually write it in a ruby dsl that then generates mm. .json files Right, because you're right. Uh, Terraform is actually cool in that you could write this, you know, high higher level language HCL, but you can also write in the JSON files, right? Yeah, right. So that's actually supported right now. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Uh, cool way. I think uh, this kind of project would be very much in use and needed and asked uh, before Terraform zero twelve uh, or thirteen. Uh, yeah. So when when there were no for each and people were struggling to figure out how to involve the same stuff multiple times and JSONnet or Jinja or any other uh, tooling uh, was the only way to do this. But uh, you, 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 see, you, you see, that's where you have a lot of experience here because you mentioned the specific numbers, right? Like 0 0.13, I believe that's when for each came out, right? For, so that's why you're well, like, oh, this would have been really grateful. <laughs> right? And that's why people, I think maybe, you know, use more Terragram because for each was our thing. It's for years, yeah. right? So, so that that's yeah. T Terraform is finally kind of catching up there, which I think a lot of people hopefully appreciate. I appreciate. I'm like, finally a for each. <laughs> <laughs> well, but there are still a lot of limitations. So, take it easy. Okay, <laughs> cool, cool. Let's uh, look into another question because uh, this question is pretty long, 
can you give a hint how to control stage and production deploy based on git flow for example use tags branch or maybe something else maybe you can advise good blog about that yeah uh, yeah 100 percent um so this is the problem that's like, always asked how can i use the same infrastructure code to deploy and create a development version and a production version of my environments, right? And then it's the same thing that actually is asked in the application land too, where I want a, a development version or a stage version of my application deployed, and then I want a production version of my application deployed. But anyway, so the way you kind of do that with TerraSpace is um, it's a concept that I actually took from uh, Lono and then also in UFO and these other kind of tools. Uh, it's called layering. Uh, basically, uh, layering works like this. Uh, you use the same infrastructure code, but then you build a different permutation of the Terraform project. So you materialize a different Terraform project uh, with a different TSE and B. So, but in, in this case, the code is exactly the same, but you're going to be able to use different TFR files, right? So what layering does, and this is kind of a simple example of layering and an introduction to it, is you could basically say, put all my base or common variables you know, and this is a this is a concept again borrowed from uh, not just my tools, but a lot of other tools, right? Like Salt, like Chef, they all have this concept of environment, and then there's a common kind of layer, like that's in configuration land. But anyway, it's, it's the same concept. It's nothing new. It's just I, I'm putting together, I'm integrating. So base is where you put your common TFR files. Let's say you want all the same, I don't know, instance type, right? And then Dev and Prod is another TFR files that gets layered like a pancake. Uh, so what you could do is like by default the environment is dev, uh, so it's gonna merge base and and dev together, and that produces uh, basically the TF bar file that gets used. Um, and then uh, for another environment, you would actually just go prod with the same code with different variables. So it's uh, I I think you know obviously my opinion here because I graded it right, but. I think this is very dry because you can actually just have your, your common variables here and then only the delta, only the difference mm -hmm. in environment specific TFR files because they get merged and layered. And the way it actually works for, you know, because I, I think a lot of the people who kind of follow you are actually pretty well versed in Terraform and all that. The way it actually works in the details is it actually just generates t auto TFR files. Mm -hmm. so you see? So these auto TFR files, if they exist in that current folder, which is where we're running the Terraform apply command in, these are automatically merged. So I don't actually do any glue logic here. I'm yeah. using just leveraging Terraform. And I'm like, oh, that's great. I, you know, that, that's awesome. I don't have to do more work, right? So this is kind of how it works. You will use the exact same code with a different e environment here to essentially create a different uh, permutation or envi uh, environment of your infrastructure. Hopefully that answers that question. And there's a lot more of layering that I can get into, but it's kind of up to you, uh, you Anton. I, I don't know if that's worth it. Yeah, no, I think I think it's a very good uh, explanation. And uh, the thing which I, I like, there are two things which I really like in your uh, like last uh, three minute speech, is that uh, first of all, you don't like to do uh, something what Terraform already does. So that's why you rely on internals very heavily. And uh, that's like to my experience this is really important that your tool is not trying to be very smart in all of this and you don't try to like uh, predict what people mean or maybe implement some specifics if you do this and then then it's just impossible to stay on top of uh, terraform uh, because terraform is still developing like crazy so one day they will get rid of some features and uh, well hopefully which is not going to happen in the near future, but still. <laughs> but uh, at least when I see something like this, it reminds me uh, configurations which I saw people writing for Terragram, where you can include uh, optional and required configuration files. And you provide usually like from 1 to 20 paths, uh, and then uh, it will include the first one which, is, uh, which it finds, or something like that. Uh, well, you can do this, but uh, in most cases, uh, we have to write code which is easy to work and easy to understand and easy to operate. I mean, you don't have to impress people that, hey, look at me, I can do these things which nobody understands. 
because I mean, yeah. if we if we need to have these kind of competitions, let's do this. It's pretty fun too. But in general, we have to be focusing on something what is easy to operate and generating these base files uh, with auto uh, extension is good point to my mind. But what about yeah. uh, dynamic values inside of TFRs? What about uh, something what is not known in runtime? Uh, I guess it is inside of dynamics uh, folder. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so something that's not known to runtime, like say like the outputs from another stack, right? Yeah. Or basically a dependent stack that needs yeah. to be, uh, be uh, applied first before you could. Yeah. So this is this is the question, of course, the first question you asked me, like, uh, <laughs> when we, you, you hit me up, like, a month ago or two months ago, you're like, Tom, this is the first question. <laughs> I was like, okay, man, that's hard. <laughs> so let me sleep on it and think about it. So, yeah, I went for lots of walks, uh, and then eventually yeah, I was like, okay, I, I think this is the way it should fit, and this is actually what I was intending to do for another tool, actually. But I just never kind of got to it, and then I was like, okay, this is kind of the right time to do it. So, mm. so then I implemented uh, kind of... Uh, a little more dynamic control okay so first to answer that question like uh, what if you want to use um, values from something that's lazy that's that that it's, it happens at runtime I think that's where you use runtime right mm -hmm. so first just generally see these TFR files that I just show you with layering you get use layering uh, but the TFR files that's just my daughter's ring uh, around making a tornado sound out there that's yeah anyway so um uh here you can actually use erb here too so you can use like dynamic control here too erb now gives you access again to programming language right uh and so you have full control to like and i'm gonna add a couple more concepts soon i've just been kind of working on different branches um to uh basically allow you guys to add your own method so uh basically custom user defined helper methods but anyway uh you can use erb here okay however there's some built-in erb helper methods that are extremely useful Call output. Okay, and I, 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 so this output basically says, grab me the stack name called VPC. Grab that output key here with VPC ID, and then assign it to here. But that's actually lazy. That happens mm -hmm. at runtime because VPC is uh, not going to be defined yet, right? So uh, this is actually what the uh, the graph commands and Terra Space all commands kind of leverage. When you are calling this output method, uh, it actually, what happens is TerraSpace actually registers the dependent stacks internally. And then it uses that registration information to build up the dependency graph. And then uh, when it comes time to apply this specific stack, which happens to be a demo stack here, that's when it's going to, at runtime, or lazily, pull in the state file information and then grab the output. So that's how you can kind of grab information lazily between stacks, right? Because if you are grabbing information within, let's say, a Terraform, we're talking about pure Terraform now, pure Terraform module, well, you just grab it, right? Because it's already, it's just leverage Terraform. Terraform already supports that. And mm -hmm. as a, a 0.13 at some point depends on became a thing, and you can do depends on between modules. And I, I know you mentioned there's like some limitations that I don't fully grasp yet. But there are some limitations with that too. But when you're kind of you're kind of building infrastructure and you're modularizing your things or organizing your code to like modular structures or modular stacks, like a VPC stack, an instance stack, right, a database stack. When when you're doing that, you you're not really gonna. You can either do like you have kind of two options. You could basically put everything into one big Terraform God module that basically mm. handles everything, right? Yep. Uh, everything is coupled, but then you get for free uh, orchestration from Terraform because Terraform yep. can handle depends on everything. But that's not what they recommend. They recommend you doing a separate state files and separate essentially stacks or, or, or separate Terraform projects or separate Terraform cloud uh, workspaces, right? Don't, tell, don't tell workspaces. Workspaces. Exactly. It's and forbidden. so when you do it that way, you lose orchestration. So then what basically TerraSpace does is it essentially helps you with that part that's missing from, mm. from the tooling, which happens to be a dependency resolution and then orchestrating this. So one part I want to show with this real quickly uh, is you see this uh, whole output thing? You go to dependency graphs and you go to uh, TF bars, complex types. 
here's the really interesting thing I found, and I just kind of found this kind of by looking at it. So this is just another documentation page showing that you can use output to wire up a dependent stack to this uh, this stack right here. And say, hey, simple types, you just, you know, you just go simple types as a string. Mm -hmm. That's just, By simple type, I mean like strings, booleans, and like in, uh, in, in number. But complex types, let's say like a, a list or a map, you know, uh, those are more complex type. So you actually use the same code. Because mm -hmm. what actually happens internally is a two JSON happen, a two JSON happens. So basically, a JSON dump where this gets converted to JSON. And guess what? JSON is actually understood by Terraform. So I was like, oh, that's cool. So that actually actually just works. It's like here's an example with a list of string. See list string. Here's yeah. an example of map string. And that just it just works. Now, what happens if let's say you go well, my you know my stack downstream doesn't take this input format. This sucks. I need to kind of convert it, right? So it's true. You will have to convert it by using local variable and then using native HCL to convert it. However, mm -hmm. there's actually another option too. You could actually use a two Ruby method here, and then actually, and I found the Ruby um, collection methods a little bit easier to use. I'm just maybe more used to Ruby, but then you actually go to Ruby and then last a two JSON back here. So mm -hmm. you can actually you have access to the full power of the filtering and selection yeah. uh, methods from the Ruby programming language also, or you could use uh, locals here too. So it's kind of really up to you. It's kind of, TerraSpace says, here are some kind of batteries included, conventions, some structure. So you, you, you know, because that's, I think that's the hardest part. Like literally when I was like starting to learn Terraform, like the first thing I saw was like project structure. There's like a million blog posts about like everybody's own opinion about the project structure. So yeah. I was like, okay, well, <laughs> we'll just basically define something, but allow it to be configurable, um, if, I, if that makes sense. Anyway. Yeah, I think uh, one interesting point which uh, you you can do here is that uh, once you set uh, this as a variable, uh, you can also use Terraform functions to convert between types the way you want. So let's say if you don't need all subnets, but you need, uh, let's say, first subnet, then you can use element uh, function inside of Terraform and get first element. The problem is that uh, you cannot use functions inside of TFWars files and that's why you need to use something earlier than Terraform TFWars, which is Ruby in this case. Yeah, you nailed it. Yeah, ex that's exactly why I exposed this Ruby helper too, because sometimes, you know, you don't have access to maybe modifying that module, right? Yeah. I, I, I would say that most of the stuff that you should do though, you should, you should probably try to abstract that business logic to the stack. So stack is yeah. just a term I made up, but I didn't make it up. Everybody else uses that term also. I think Lumi uses the term stack also. I think Terabrand uses stack also. CloudFormation uses stack also. Pulumi, so stack is just another term. Pulumi yeah. uses uh, stack because Paul stack works there. Hello, Paul, if you watch this as well. <laughs> okay. Paul stack, Paul stack is his name. His, oh, last, his last name is stack. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So, um, well, there are more questions from people. Uh, yeah, I think it's pretty cool. So I'm kind of excited uh, with more questions from people. So keep it uh, going, guys. So the next question uh, is, is the app modules folder used when you build your modules from, uh, from scratch or it has some functionality when you create modules calling public git modules so literally does it run uh, terraform in it okay so two questions there one was the modules uh when they're built is it kind of being built from scratch and the other one is does it doesn't run terraform in it? i believe those are the questions yeah um so yes the modules get built essentially from scratch here because um essentially see this folder right here app module stack that gets mirrored if you kind of go in like uh, TerraSpace catch, um, not that, okay. And then uh, here, so look at the, look at what I just did. I just typed tree, um, you know, in the cache folder that got materialized. Mm -hmm. And then you can see this is actually mirrored, right? So yep. if your folders are kind of here, yeah, all just does a mirror, it, it mirrors over. And then here's the funny thing. This is using dot, dot, dot up. And it's kind of two levels up and then goes to modules, then go example. So like, from mm -hmm. the, you know, from your the way you mentally think about this model is like, oh, that makes sense. It's just like where it is here. However, this is where it can get, 
you know, when I was explaining this to actually my, my buddy, he was like, that's a little bit confusing. So this next part might be a little bit confusing, but let me try to explain. Okay, so hopefully, hopefully I answer that first question. Oh, okay, well, no, let me answer the init question first, and then I'll, I'll explain the little bit more kind of sophisticated way in which uh, TerraSpace can materialize this project. Okay, but init, yes, init gets run. Okay, init gets run, but it gets auto init. So I introduced the concept called auto net. Um, let's see under config here under reference. And, and by the way, you know, when earlier you kind of said, well, let me answer it first and I'll roll back my questions. Okay. Sorry. My mind's kind of, uh, trying to answer. Uh, I'm juggling a couple. Okay. So init basically, let's see init right here init mode. So there's three different modes for init and it's configurable. So a lot of what you see is actually configurable. Batteries are included but you can kind of replace and customize and have full, like a lot of control over the internals actually in space, right? So what happens is uh, when you were actually doing your uh, demo earlier, you're like, let me find where the knit log is and you can find it. Because and you're like, let me scroll up a little higher so I can find it, right? And they're like, oh man, my history's kind of all the way up there now, so I'll just move on. Because the knit only runs when it needs to, right? Mm -hmm. It's auto knit, and that's the default mode. But you can change it to always if you want, or you can change it to never, okay? So mm -hmm. whenever you call a TerraSpace up, so, so so far I believe the only thing I'm showing you guys is the TerraSpace build. But let's say I, you know I only show you TerraSpace build. I'll run it again, but you don't have to kind of run that. I'm gonna actually clean up the cache completely. Okay, I'm gonna go clean all, and I'm just gonna do it with Y to clean up everything. Otherwise, it, it kind of prompts you. So I'm just cleaning up all the like the the cache logs, the logs, and everything, right? Or you get anyway. So, but I'm gonna run a TerraSpace all uh, up now. And what that does is it does the same thing that I did manually, which is TerraSpace build, and it tells you what it's doing while I was doing it. Then it does the Terraform init, and the reason why I, I clear my cache is so I can show you that the init was happening. See, the init's happening, because I cleared out the cache, mm -hmm. so it needed to init, okay? So yes, init automatically gets called, but it doesn't all get called all the time, because init, it's, uh, there's some penalty involved with that, right? It's a little slow sometimes, so watch, watch me run again. It's gonna actually, look, I don't see the init call. What's up with that? You know, and TerraSpace tries to tell you what it's doing. See, mm. and, and here's kind of, see, it's telling you that it's going to run TerraSpace plan, and it runs it. So it tells you the commands that it runs to. So it tries to be very transparent there. But here, init ran here on the first time. The mm. second time it didn't, because it gets all to init. And then kind of what happens is, if there's like some kind of code you change that requires reinitialization, re then TerraSpace is going to actually do what you would normally do as a human being, which is mm. run Terraform init, right? So right. it automatically is going to run Terraform init when it needs to, when it detects that basically it was an init error. Mm. And then it's going to then proceed to run Terraform apply and kind of move on. And then just now that I'm on here, look at this. This was kind of interesting. When I was messing around with Terraform Cloud, uh, I noticed that Terraform Cloud always provides you with a plan. That's just how it works, right? So I really mm. kind of like that because when you do like Terraform apply auto proof, like right here, it doesn't actually give you the plan. So let's say if you were like, you ran it, you walk away for coffee, and then you come back, you're like, what What just happened? Oh, no, I ran like, you know, I ran auto approved. Now I don't know what happened, right? So a convenience that TerraSpace adds is it always does a plan before apply with the dash Y option. So then you in the logs, you see it. You mm. see the information because I'm like, I walk, I come back. I'm like, I want to know what changed because, you know, a lot of people yeah. tell you, don't ever run run auto approve um you know in, in real world in use case don't ever do it but we all do it right <laughs> so this is like a, a, another kind of way to kind of know what you, what happened kind of afterwards yeah, so man. i think i answer hopefully the, those two questions and i said there was another thing i wanted to talk about real quickly about this module that gets built uh, you know or, mm -hmm. or or generated or materialized whatever you want to say right this module yes it gets kind of built from scratch but it doesn't have to be built from scratch. So the other thing I want to talk about is Terrafile. So this thing basically is not a new concept. I, I'm not building anything new. Uh, this concept already exists. There's like a bunch of different Terrafile implementations, right? This is basically an implementation written with uh, essentially like a DSL. I like what you said about Ruby programmers. They just naturally <laughs> write DSLs. I, I guess that's true. But anyway, so what you can kind of do here is you actually just specify the module you want if you don't have a version, then what it does, is it, it locks that version and it snapshots the version by generating a Terrafile lock file. Okay, so basically you could go TerraSpace bundle. And then what's gonna happen is this file is gonna be created now, Terrafile lock, in there. And then basically what it did was it did a lot of automation for you. It downloaded the latest version from master, 
and then a snapshot that. And then you commit this to version control, and other people on your team will use it. They use the exact same version. And the kind of neat thing about this is you can use any module uh, in the open source community, or let's say you have a, you know your company has private repos and stuff, then you use your own private repos too. But a lot of modules I found were all yours, <laughs> and so, so I was like, dude, this guy's a machine. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. so uh, I actually have a lot of demos actually using your model uh, modules and stuff. And I can show you that maybe in a later demo. Uh, but I, I think I hopefully have answered most of those questions. Um, and, and the Terra file in the demo, I'll explain a little bit more maybe thoroughly if we have time and everything. Uh, because yeah. um, it, it works a little bit even differently than what I can just explain. But I just want to give at least an intro to it. Yeah, I think uh, it's a really good point. And I'm sure that many people who use Terraform for some time, they discovered that, uh, okay, Terraform tell us that we can control versions of providers and uh, Terraform itself, and there are pretty good established principles already. But when it comes to versioning of modules itself, uh, well, it's wild, wild west. You can do whatever <laughs> you want. Uh, and uh, I don't have to go uh, far in history, but even this week, people who didn't pin versions became my beta testers. Yeah. So uh, I, released, I released something what was uh, not uh, working for them and they didn't pin version. And then they say, oh, now our pipeline is not working as it was before. So I said, thank you very much. And uh, next time, please pin your version. And uh, if there would be tool like Terrafile, and again, I think that there has to be feature built in inside of Terraform. And I'm quite sure that it will eventually be part of Terraform 015 because 014 has already a log file for Terraform provider versions. And 015 probably will have even more uh, constraint because, hey, 1.0 has to be released next year. So there has to be some, uh, some improvements uh, to be able to log uh, versions for everything. So yeah, uh, I'm looking forward to that improvement because uh, I agree this should be happening in Terraform itself, right? But I, I think yeah. Terraform they see themselves more as like the found foundational like layer, like the they provide essentially the wood, right? Mm. They provide the language, and, and you know because you know it, it takes a lot of time and effort, I guess. They, yeah. they, they haven't provided I feel like enough tooling to kind of make the workflow experience kind of like more smooth. So yeah, like yeah, when that happens, like yeah, just use the Terraform one. That's what we would do. Yeah. Um, but I wonder though, when they do provide it, like, because here's the way they implemented this, which is kind of like interesting to me. Like here, right? And this is why other people invented Terrace ter file or whatever, right? So you, what you would do is like, you know, you use like whatever GitHub dot org dot repo, right? Yep. And then you like, and then you won't lock it here, right? But then, if you or, or, or if you lock it, you will lock it like here. You go zero point zero one, right? Yeah. So here's the thing, and then when you run init, it essentially analyzes your uh, Terraform code, all of your modules, right? And mm -hmm. then from there, it's gonna require all the dependencies, figure out all the versions, and download all the providers as well as modules. Yeah. So it's doing that with init. But this approach, I thought was like kind of interesting because for what's worth, I did the same approach for another tool, which I kind of regret. So I was like, oh, don't do it this way with TerraSpace, okay? Yeah. Because the version is now embedded in your source code all over the place. Yeah. Right? It's not centralized. So it's like, you now you have to do grep. You know, you have to do a find. You have to do a search until you find all the places and then you have to update in multiple spots. You know, mm. and, and that's just kind of the nature of the beast um, of current how it current, currently works. Well, yeah. the, the, for uh, like to, to make this simple, especially what I use uh, during uh, workshops, and if I'm talking to people who are familiar with uh, uh, like with software development, and then they ask like, "Oh, Terraform is another type of tool, and it does not actually do the same things as we use we get used with software development," then my best explanation is treat modules as libraries, like literally. Uh, you probably have package JSON file or Ruby or gem, gem file already in your repository or gem file uh, lock in your repository, which already contain all of this information uh, about your dependencies, versions and so on. So the same has to be uh, in centralized way in known location. So uh, anyway, I think people uh, uh, will uh, eventually 
uh, start using more tools like Xterrafile or Terrafile or whatever is uh, whatever they're called now because there are uh, at least a couple years ago there were about 10 of them uh, which you can easily go on uh, PP and uh, Ruby Gems uh, website and easily find anything you want. So uh, yeah, that's definitely going to happen. Okay, uh, we have a couple more questions. Uh, uh, this one is a little bit long. Uh, we'll try to read it. Can one use TerraSpace to simplify creation of stacks in linked AWS accounts from the management account of the organization? For example, via AWS provider assume role property. So, uh, so I think uh, what uh, Sergey meant was, is it possible to manage infrastructure in multiple AWS accounts? Yeah, it is. So uh, this is I'm going back to layering now, right? Um, so I'm going to now talk about the maybe more uh, advanced layering because I, I kind of mentioned layering earlier. And I'm just showing the link right here on basic layering, which is base, dev, and prod, right? Mm -hmm. So this is the idea, the concept, and I think I, I think I, I think I did it more proper this time. And, and the other frameworks I wrote, layering is supported too, but because TerraSpace or Terraform itself actually is so interesting because it's, it supports multiple cloud providers, I, I took a, a, a different approach. So anyway, so uh, layering here, okay, basically layers base and dev or base and prod depending on TS EMV. Full layering, which I'm about to show you now and reveal, right? Mm -hmm is actually a lot more powerful. This allows you to use the same infrastructure code, not just to create different environments like dev and prod, but actually deploy to multiple regions or multiple accounts and even multiple providers, right? All these layers are basically stacked on top of each other like a pancake. So uh, when I showed this to some other co coders uh, and, and engineers, they were like, oh, it's like inheritance kind of. I guess, you know, I guess that's one way to think about it, right? Basically base, it's all common stuff. And what I did was because there's so many layers here, I kind of started like to organize this documentation. I just put these kind of layers together in group for the sake of conciseness, I say. So base and dev, they get merged here in the root folder. But then you can actually create a region folder here. Here's an example. And then basically you have base and dev in here too. And those kind of get pancake and stacked on top of each other. Or namespace. And namespace, the reason I'm using a generic term for namespace here is because there's multiple... TerraSpace out of the box supports both Zero, Google, and AWS. So namespace in uh, mm. AWS is a, the account ID. In Azure is the subscription, and Google is the project. It's the same thing, and it's just different pro cloud providers, right? Um, so what you can do if you want to deploy, let's say, here's an example multiple regions, and I'll show you how to do it with multiple accounts, okay? So multiple regions, you would just say, A, a different region here, and guess what? A different pro project gets built, gets generated, mm. gets materialized. Right, because that that's included into the uh, TerraSpace cache key, which is again is also configurable. This is all configurable. Um, and then what you could do is you actually say, "Hey, deploy to a different region, right? All the dev environments, or deploy to a different, um, basically, uh, region of all the prod environments." And then you could actually do the same thing in the account. Now, with the account, what I actually like to do is, uh, at least in the uh, projects that I work with, I set up like a production account tied to the development. Uh, environment and i set up i'm sorry i, I just really mixed that <laughs> i set up a development avs account to the uh, tsv environment uh develop environment dev environment and then i set up a production avs account a segregated account for security purposes and just a nice guardrail to, to the tsev prod so then kind of what i would do with that is actually i would um configure the uh, environment to override mm. so you see how there's like an environment to override here you can actually go in here and um, you could configure the framework with this like configure block here under config app, and then you configure things like the logger and stuff. But you can actually configure like let's say specific environmental variable overrides. I guess I do it. Maybe I do it also here. Is that where the docs are? Hmm. No, this is with our bar sort. Hmm. I'm trying to figure out where can I have the docs for that um, boot hook. Oh, it's a hook. The okay. So there's a hook that happens very early on. Um with a uh, terror space that you can actually use to then run any kind of clip logic you want. And that's where I usually, hmm, I can't really find it right now. So I'm going to have to maybe look that up later. But what I'm saying is 
what I would do is I would use a different layer that's spe specific to the environment, but I wouldn't actually specify the kind of idea there. You could do it. You could do it with the environment variable, but I actually tie that to like a different AWS account to a different TSV EMV, and then automatically have that uh, AWS profile switch over as part mm -hmm. of DMV. So they're always, so I don't accidentally deploy like development to production and I don't deploy production to development. I don't want to ha that to happen. So what I'll do is actually configure, you know, the settings to say dev deployed to a separate account, prod deployed to a separate account. But yes, that's completely all doable and it's done with essentially the power of layering. And mm -hmm. you know, and then you can make it a little bit, this flow smoother with basically config hooks and stuff like that. Hopefully that made sense. Yeah, I, th I think uh, it makes sense. But uh, uh, the idea which uh, Sergey was highlighting mm -hmm. is that is it possible to use uh, Terraform, let's say Terraform provider feature to assume role uh, in different accounts? So let's say, is it possible? Oh. Is it possible to configure uh, Terraform or AWS provider to assume role depending on which environment you are managing? Well, if you can do it in Terraform, then you should be able to do it in TerraSpace, but I don't really know. Um, what I do is I actually just go configure that provider, provider, then I use AWS Profile to yeah. automatically switch. That's how I kind of do it myself personally. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if you're kind of having a whole, like if you're using actually HCL to switch providers and stuff like that, yeah, then whatever you can do with HCL, you should be able to do also. Yeah. Um, but, and that's actually very much related uh, with, with the comment which... Um, here is it. Uh, Sebastian wrote, love how transparent TerraSpace is. Because as you said that, uh, uh, yes, there are a few concepts which you add on top of uh, existing Terraform, but most of these concepts are not limiting you from what you can do with just HCL. I mean, you can still write whatever you want in Terraform configs and you can use 100% of features. Actually, when you're explaining this now, I see few things and few different uh, like extra or additions uh, comparing to what uh, I cannot do with Terragrant. For example, uh, in, in Terragrant, uh, it's not possible to use uh, like, uh, so Terragrant gives you a few possibilities to specify dependencies and Terragrant adds few functions itself. So if you start using Terragrant, it will be harder for you to go away from that, uh, which is not a problem in most cases because people are not uh, uh, taking this uh, so often. I mean, you, you don't ch change between Terraform and Terragrant daily, but uh, this is just one thing which I think is uh, quite interesting. Yeah, I think there's a philosophy thing too, a philosophical yeah. thing. So like three years ago when I started like Bull Ops and I, I started thinking about how I'm going to build these tools, it just, I, I took what thoughts in my mind. I was like, philosophically, how do I like to build tools and how I like tools to work is mm. it's usually like a light layer. And then it mm. tells you transparently what it's doing. So it's printing out the commands, right? Yeah. So philosophically, I wrote this blog article still somewhat applies because it's just saying that, look, a lot of people are just like are kind of obsessed with that cloud agnosticism, which mm. is, I, I think it's really hard to achieve. Uh, but then they don't really consider that tools change too. So whatever tool you provide, you kind of get stuck with, right? Mm. <laughs> Unless yeah. that tool kind of says, hey, we're just providing a lightweight layer. And then guess what? You still know what's going on underneath. And, and some people think that's called leaky abstraction. But I think in some ways, leaky abstractions are OK, because then you know what's going on, yep. right? So yeah, that's absolutely. what I, I, I try to do with the, most of the tools. So it's just like it, that article still, I think, applies uh, generally. Uh, I, I say the one I say generally still applies because in the article, I emphasize light tools, but I will say that this is not necessarily light tools. The tools get more complicated mm -hmm. because the requirements get more complicated, right? But overall, though, it's still just bleeding through and saying, hey, Terraform R does this. Mm, yeah. Why are we going to spend time not doing something Terraform R does? And then Terraform, you know, and if Terraform is going to release something new, then we're probably not going to work on it, right? But then yeah. it depends because sometimes, you know, like, you know, it takes, they have to prioritize things, and like, that's totally understandable. Sometimes they take years, right? So then, then we will have to kind of do it if we need it. Yeah, yeah, that's, I, I think that's the main reason uh, why there are so many tools and so many different solutions. Some of these solutions are quite similar is because people have two options, whether sit and wait when someone else fixes this for them 
or uh, they start working on it themselves like you do in this case with TerraSpace. Which uh, brings me to the next question. So the next question by Maxim is why TerraSpace suggest git ignore dot TerraSpace cache? Like uh, it should be more or less stable. Why not track changes on it? Even, uh, even it kind of orchestrate or generated. Even so is it why are we ignoring this file? Uh, yeah, I think. Yeah, uh, so yeah I think uh, right. that's the main question. Yeah. Sure. So uh, sometimes, actually, I, I recommend not ignoring this file for the specific case of Terraform Cloud or Terraform <laughs> Enterprise. Uh, but if you're just running Terraform and you have full CLI control of it, like here, mm -hmm. uh, then yeah, uh, I think this should be ignored because these kind of like this is generated like you know files. So you can commit them if you want, so you can see them. But what you're going to do is you're not going to change the cache files, right? Yeah. Those are generated. So usually, like, like artifacts are, are usually ignored, you know, I, I, I think. So um, you would change the original source files, and then the generated files you would usually get ignored. But I guess you commit them if you want. Now, I said in Terraform Cloud, right? So mm -hmm. Terraform Cloud supported out of the box. Uh, where is it? Um cloud here I guess so Terraform cloud uh, you know it just allows you to run your um, your Terraform scripts uh, remotely right in, 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 a, in a in a consistent virtual machine is kind of what they say in their docs mm -hmm. but Terraform cloud has two different workflows or three in their docs there's a CLI workflow a VCS workflow and an API workflow but really the API workflow is uh, handled already by the CLI workflow because mm -hmm. they provide the tooling. We're not building anything that we don't need to here. So the CLI-driven workflow works is just like what you see here when I ran like TerraSpace, you know, up demo, okay? Mm -hmm. So that's the CLI workflow. But the VCS workflow works a little differently. VCS workflow is essentially version churl is the, is the, is the source of truth. That's what their docs say, okay? Mm -hmm. So that means you have to commit the code, right? Now, you can't really commit... You know, just by the nature of the way Terraform Cloud is built, you, you have to commit Terraform files. You can't really commit, like, TerraSpace files because those are source code files that then builds a project, right? Yep. So in order to run Terraform Cloud or Terraform Enterprise VCS-driven workflow, a bunch of words there, right? You have to actually not ignore this folder and commit those source code files. And I know people... It's interesting because that question is like, you should commit those files. But well, most people will say, you should commit those files. Yeah. And now I'm saying for this, you're, you're supposed to commit the files because you have to because that's the only way to run it. And then, then I think some purists are going to say, oh, you shouldn't commit those artifacts. That's horrible, blah, 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 right? Well, that's kind of the only way you can run it on this kind of particular platform. And I actually don't think it's that bad because uh, that's that's what you, you're going to see in the diff. Whenever you're using Terraform Cloud or Terraform Enterprise, you're going to see the diff and you're going to be able to apply that diff. And this was actually built specifically for this use case. The way after I have re-architected it from 0 0.2 to 0 0.3, the way things were built specifically for Terraform Cloud because of this version control workflow, right? But I, I want to emphasize here that it's not just, okay, Terraform will, or TerraSpace will, you know, you commit these files, then you have to go there to Terraform Cloud, like the dashboard, and manually wire things up, manually set up your environmental variables, manually set the, uh, the builder, uh, the working directory is, is, I think that's what the settings call it, right? Mm -hmm. You don't do any of that manually, actually. It's all automated. TerraSpace automates as much as this as possible. What I kind of mm -hmm. mean by that is, you see, when you set up workspace names and stuff like this, you actually set up like a real back backend here yep. with the expansion pattern again the same. And guess what? The cloud bars can actually, you can write the JSON here, and those will actually get synced over. It's mm -hmm. everything in TerraSpace is very one directional. One directional, and I learned this from actually a JavaScript framework called React.js. Like they had a concept of like very one directional, and that helped them solve some 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 of their bugs on Facebook and all that kind of stuff. I think Facebook was the yeah. So anyway, so it's very one directional versus kind of like you know having multiple things ha happening in multiple directions. It's just here's your source files, and you're gonna sync it this one direction. That makes it very very clear. So this these bars JSON file here, these are variables that are gonna be in one direction sync to Terraform Cloud on all your workspaces because the issue with Terraform Cloud is they recommend you create all these workspaces, but then you have to manually go do that or you write a bash script to do that or you write some type of script to sync that. Well, yeah. TerraSpace does that. 
Terry Space will basically uh, create the uh, the VAR files, whether or not they're uh, secret VAR files, sensitive, I guess, or mm -hmm. non-sensitive. They will sync it over, or whether or not they're environment aware variable files or, or regular Terraform variables in the TF file dashboard. It will sync that over. It will also automatically uh, use the API to set the working directory. So it swings. So so you're not gonna go. I just want to be clear. You're not gonna kind of go. You know, here's TerraSpace info demo path. See this path right here? You're not gonna go and manually configure this. Yeah. It, it does it for you, right? So, and then, so like TerraSpace Cloud Sync help here, right? So this sync command, what it does for Terraform Cloud, and I, I guess it is applicable for people who are using Terraform Cloud, but if not, I guess they're not gonna care about as much. But what it's do, it's gonna tell you what it's gonna do. It's gonna say, hey, you wanna sync all the projects? It's gonna take, take this stack and then it's gonna create this workspace. And it's gonna sync all the variables over. It's gonna sync the working directory and set it to the one that I just basically listed out with this command here. So you don't kind of do it manually, right? And then mm -hmm. when you do apply, it essentially kind of makes that CLI call over. It just uses the CLI. So it tries mm -hmm. to automate as much as possible. And by the way, the sync command, you can run it separately. And I only did this because it's a very specific, a specific use case. If you're like TFE admin, doesn't want to give you permissions to create your workspaces because he, he wants administration access. And he wants to like you know for security purpose give you a guardrail, then he's not gonna let you create the workspaces, right? Mm -hmm. So what you can do is you just tell him, hey, can you run this to create all my workspaces ahead of time for me, right? But normally, if you have admin permission or permission to create the workspace, then you could actually just run TerraSpace up, and then the workspace will automatically be created by, by TerraSpace. Also, it just depends if you have admin permission or not. Mm -hmm. Okay. So anyway, I went on a tangent there with ter TerraSpace to answer this question. This should be ignored. I think generally it's just my opinion. You could not ignore it by just deleting this, I guess. Well, I think, I think again, this is a uh, third point which we uh, have during today's conversation uh, when we can easily con compare this one with software development principles. Like, if you would write code, uh, would, you com would you commit your binary? Well, sometimes yes, sometimes not. Uh, would you would you commit your minified files in uh, JSON or your TypeScript and JavaScript? Well, sometimes yes, because there is no way to compile from TypeScript into JavaScript, but sometimes not. I think one of, at least for me, this was a little bit confusing, is that there is one TerraSpace cache folder, but there can be a lot of input uh, variables. For example, I can set TS underscore uh, I think uh, env or what was the name of it, prod dev. And uh, then it will uh, simply uh, recreate uh, only one cache folder, which is uh, a little bit confusing because uh, uh, to my mind, there has to be uh, many cache folders depending on which uh, input parameters you provide. So, so, so it actually creates all the cache folders. Okay, okay, so this actually goes to the TerraSpace all command, okay? Hmm. So the TerraSpace all command, what it does is it builds a dependency graph and then it executes things in parallel as much as possible, right? So imagine multiple processes on your system, right, in, on, on your computer, uh, writing files at the same time. Mm -hmm. That's not gonna work, <laughs> yeah. right? So this is where I had to re-architect TerraSpace to generate all the files at once. And this also was when I re-architected it so it worked for Terraform Cloud hmm. because it has to pre-build everything. It has to. It just, you yeah. know, it, 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 so it actually, when you run TerraSpace build, it's optional to specify a stack name hmm. because it only needs one stack name in order to have enough, I guess, information to then build all the stacks and all the modules because it does in yeah. one go. It does in one go at the beginning all up front. So it, the demo shows you only one stack, but if you have more stacks, it actually, hmm. you're going to see, if you do a tree command in your cache folder, you see all the stacks being built. I they say all actually get built. That, that has to work that way in order for parallelization to work, essentially. <laughs> I, see. I see, yeah. And one observation which I see here is that I didn't know about this integration and Terraform uh, Cloud Sync uh, from uh, TerraSpace. Uh, what you can utilize as well is that you can utilize uh, Terraform, uh, Terraform Cloud Provider or Terraform Enterprise Provider, TFE, to manage all of these things like variables, uh, policies, uh, run trigger, user permissions, and a bunch of other things. Uh, so instead of relying on API and creating these files physically, you can just generate HCL file for the user. Again, this 
file, um, I don't know. I mean, yes, this file actually can be committed as well uh, as code. Um, but uh, uh, I mean, there is a TFE provider, which is official provider by HashiCorp to manage uh, to manage both SaaS version and enterprise version. So that's... yeah, yeah, and that's all configurable. So you could use yes, you could use the um, yeah. um, you could use the, uh, the enterprise version. So this mm. is just showing you here in the docs. It shows TF file, but if you're on enterprise, right, you have a yeah. on-prem install or whatever on your data center, then uh, then you could just you know change this to uh, the whole work and everything. Yeah, I think it's actually, I think... pretty cool. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, <laughs> go ahead. Oh yeah, I think I have somewhere. I don't know where here, but oh yeah, I think it was the login one. Uh, it, I see. I spec up. So most of this documentation is written for TFC, mm -hmm. but TFE is TFC. It's just a, 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 a different variation of it designed to be installed in your own data, data center, right? Yeah. And I noticed that when you call login, it defaults to TF Cloud. Mm -hmm. But then when you, when you log in for TFE, you have to specify the host name that you set up, right? Well, okay. Whoever your HashiCorp representative is, they they help you set up. And then you just go log in with the host name and then you can configure it. Mm -hmm. well, you know, and that's how you authenticate against TFE. So the docs basically show TFE and TFC and then it calls out when it's different for TFE. Right. Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, I think you, you, you develop a little bit too much, to be honest, for how many users you have? No, look, this is brand <laughs> new. This thing exists, remember. <laughs> yeah. This thing exists like a couple months ago. Yeah, exactly. So everyone who is watching this uh, right now, uh, you, you just probably cannot imagine how much work is it. But uh, yeah, few months of work yeah. and here you are. It, it's a few months of work <laughs> because I have 10 years of like previous experience, right? Yeah, like exactly. My friend says like, because he saw this happen and he was like, yeah. how is this possible? And, I was, and then he was like, I think you've internalized the patterns. I was like, oh, yeah. maybe that's what's going on. Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, I do work a lot. So, I mean, it's... It's yeah, and, that, like, and that's really the cool part is that once you build one tool and then you can easily, let's say, abandon it because your knowledge is already stuck in your head. You don't have to make a uh, continuation for that tool or try to come up with it. You just kind of start new tool where you copy a large amount of your ideas and your solutions. And now, okay, so this, let's say, this uh, season Terraform is popular. Cool, let's make Terraform framework. So I think it's really a right approach. And there are more tools which uh, people need. So I just, uh, I really like to see when uh, people like you just come up with like uh, any idea and they didn't find any solution for, for the problem and they just start writing it and here you are. Yeah, remember, I, I didn't go off trying to, I'm gonna create a tool, right? I yeah, was exactly. like, man, it can't be this painful. It can't be this bad. I was shocked. Yeah. I was like, no, no, this, this I have to do it this way. And I was like, I have to work in this client project. So I'm like, no, no, it's got to be less painful than this, right? Mm -hmm. So then you start and then you just kind of keep on building it. Yeah, yeah, I think that's really the case. Cool. Uh, there is a comment from uh, Max who says, uh, Terra Space plus Terra Grant, is it even possible? And is it worth it? So you could use the modules that you use in Teragrunt, but it's not really possible because Teragrunt has the Teragrunt HCL file. So of course I studied that tool too, right? I studied like a couple tools. I ter studied Teragrunt and started Asteroid from uh, Uber. Astra. Maybe? Astra. Oh yeah, yeah. And, and then, then there was like, so there's some, there's, there's some tools out there. But when I look at the Teragrunt HCL file, basically that's basically what would be converted to TFRs, yep. right? So that's the difference. Like they have, that, that's one of the differences. There's a couple, there's a couple similarities too, like you said at the beginning here, but like one of the difference is Teragrunt introduces like a Teragrunt.acl file, which I'm sure a lot of your viewers kind of know, but uh, essentially it's a custom syntax on top of HCL, right? Hmm. Because they, they, they have something that's pretty cool. They can actually look into Go and all that. I, I think that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, but it does conflate the HCL syntax with Teragrunt. So then it's kind of like, you know, like, Ruby and Rails, right? Hmm. There's some Rails developers out there, and I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing because Rails has done such a great job, but they actually don't know as much of the difference between Ruby versus Rails, yep. right? So some people might not know the difference between Teragrunt HCL versus Terras, Terraform because yeah, right. the, the syntax is kind of combined. So, you no, know, you, I don't think you can use Teragrunt with Terraspace 
per se like that. I guess there's a way I could probably hack it. Mm. Uh, maybe. I don't know. I, I haven't wrapped my head around that yet. But what you will have to do currently today is just take the HTML file and then inputs. Then you have to change that to TFR files, right? And then yep. those TFR files you use, that helper method that shows you to wire, you know, the, 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 the stacks together and build, like, you know, the dependency tree and all that kind of stuff, you know? Yeah. Like this stuff right here. Uh, what, what, here one, one more thing which I kind of forgot to mention is that uh, that's really cool uh, that you have possibility to uh, have a, a Terra space cache folder and then occasionally you may want to commit it to repository trigger uh, build. Uh, there are a few very rough solutions which you can do uh, with, uh, with this approach. Uh, like this is just uh, thinking loud, but uh, imagine the situation that uh, you want to run something uh, like Python or Ruby or anything else uh, inside of your uh, Terraform cloud instance. And you don't want to pay money for that. So, uh, I mean, you have to pay uh, Terraform, what is it, cloud runners. I think, I, I don't remember the name, but there is a way to run your own custom runners, uh, which you can provision with your own tools. So I did not know about that. That's crazy. That's that's interesting. So is there like a hook into Terraform Cloud where uh, you can do anything you want? Well, uh, you just provide your Docker image, uh, which contains oh. Terraform and all other dependencies which you need. So you will have that's to... Amazing. That sounds like you could basically set it and basically TerraSpace can be integrated even more tightly. Yeah. All yeah. we have to do is build a Docker container with an entry point. Yeah. And then that entry point is basically the thing that's going to get called before. So yeah. then we want to commit the artifacts, right? Yeah, exactly. Like, like you were explaining earlier, you explained perfectly. You're like, I know I'm not supposed to commit binaries to my GitHub repo, but sometimes it's the only way I do it. We've all done it before. Well, you know? but, but I, I have not finished. Uh, for this situation, you need to pay money. Now let's talk how uh, to save money. So the case when uh, you want to save money, but you want to use something what is uh, not available. Uh, well, I don't know if it's going to work, but uh, again, I'm just uh, speaking uh, or thinking loud here. Is that uh, you wrap your... Uh, so first of all, you commit a uh, first module, uh, which does only one thing. It will execute a provisioner. And this provisioner will download the whole internet which you need and then you run it locally. <laughs> so you, you commit yeah. you commit code which looks good. Uh, the only thing which will happen in there is curl to this URL and uh, then uh, unzip this large archive and run it on that operation system with, or that container which uh, you get allocated. So this way you can install something what is uh, not available but you really want to use it and you don't want to pay for that oh i see yeah uh, i didn't know about that that's awesome uh i'm not the well uh, i didn't uh, as i things. said as i said it was just uh, my uh, thought process and how to get job done which i usually focus more than uh, whether it is right way or bad way i want to get job done and go to the next thing <laughs> yeah yeah so that's uh, one way, but uh, it's it's a little bit uh, rough, but uh, it's definitely a cool way to go around different uh, limitations. Okay, cool. So we have even more questions, which is pretty cool. Um, another question by... Yeah, right, Maxim uh, is the guy who asked about git ignore and Terra space cache folder. He also asked uh, seems dynamic uh, vars need cache git ignored so, i would commit those actually but I, it depends right what yeah in this regards what about secrets like uh let's say there are plenty of places where i can put secrets and uh what, what's your ideas or what's your workarounds about that so, there is no workaround for it currently today but the idea is uh probably introduce helpers that are cloud specific that will pull the secret from um from SMS or AWS, mm -hmm. right? For, uh, or for AWS Secrets Manager or Google Secret, right? The, the I will kind of pull in there so then you actually can commit the code because then, and, and this is not a new idea because I've already written this in, in another tool mm -hmm. that kind of does this dynamically. Now, however, you know, from like a security, I guess, perspective, compliance perspective, the secrets is not going to be committed to code, but it's still going to be your state file. 
right? Mm. So, so it's, it's not one of those things where it happens all server side and it's not on your state file. So then the only thing you really have to do in order to get the state files, you can't run in your machine, right? That's how you get on the compliance side. You have to run it on a CI, CD build pipeline or you have to run it in Terraform file or Terraform enterprise, right? right. Because it's passing through your machine and then your, your state file is has the secrets, right? Mm. Uh, unless, that, hopefully Terraform, you know, comes up with some type of, I don't know, encoding or encryption, I mean, to kind of help you with that. So then at least you have to have a key to unlock it. Um, but that's how I probably approach it. I probably say, hey, you know, add a secret helper method here that's specific to AWS, yeah. add a secret helper method here that's specific to Google and so forth. Right. Yeah, so that's, uh, so far, this is the only approach which seems to be uh, required in the near future. And I, I don't see any plans or any clear solutions or any aha moment from anyone who say like, oh, we now know how to do this. Because there are known issues, no limitations uh, within Terraform itself, which uh, it's just impossible to uh, go around. Yeah, it's an unresolved problem. It's one yeah. of those unresolved problems. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Uh, we already almost two hours, which is pretty cool. <laughs> Uh, we have few more questions. So thanks a lot everyone for asking these questions. And I already kind of think that we'll have to make another uh, interview and another session with uh, Tung because this is getting uh, way more popular than I personally at least anticipated. And I thought that there will be no people. <laughs> but hey, come on. There are... You have people watching your stream. It's my stream that has no views, right? <laughs> well. No, no. Actually, actually, talking about your uh, channel, there is uh, uh, this comment by Maxim, who said that Tung, you have a very nice YouTube channel. I just subscribed. Really? Yeah, I so, got an additional subscriber. Yeah, so you you will see your graph uh, skyrocketing today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and when the baseline is low, pretty much anything skyrockets. <laughs> yeah. right? it depends where the baseline starts. Thank yeah. you, Maxim. And uh, another uh, guy, David Lozano, just wrote is that I see most of Tong's uh, e uh, infrastructure as code YouTube videos are about cloud formation. What yeah. did make him to start using Terraform and what advantages over cloud formation he has found in his journey? Oh, yeah, the cloud formation versus Terraform question, sure. Um, <laughs> so the reason I do a lot of cloud formation is because I do focus usually on AWS, right? And the AWS CloudFormation tool, the native or the native orchestration tool, and for AWS CloudFormation. So this makes sense. You just use CloudFormation. When you're doing AWS work and that's your sole focus, that's AWS work. Well, it didn't become my sole focus because the projects changed kind of, right? Hmm. So some of my client project, you know, they, they require basically use of Terraform. So that's the reason why I started using Terraform a little more, right? And um, yeah, I do see pros and cons of both. Uh, there's going to be, this is going to be one of those questions where it's like, it depends, yeah. right? It, 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 it's there's no so there are some things where I think Terra, Cloudform is ahead of, of the um, you know in uh, on AWS in terms of Terraform because they they own you know the tool they already know what they're about to release so they're going to hopefully work in the providers but there are some cases where Terraform is actually ahead right yeah. and some providers like Terraform is kind of ahead they work a little differently CloudFormation is stateless you know Terraform is stateful there's some pros and advantages of both. State, stateless just means you don't have to deal with the state. You, like there's no conversation in cloud formation about where you, how you configure back into yep. You don't. You know, AWS does it for you. So that's kind of nice. However, then AWS does it for you. You don't mm. have control of it, right? Terraform, you have control with it. You can actually go move the state around, adjust things if like things don't match. And just generally the behavior is a little bit different. Terraform does like a plan where it reconciles the, what's different out there on the physical cloud versus what's in your code before. Cloud formation, because it stores the state information, kind of blindly assumes that the resource is still in the state. So the behavior is actually pretty different. Well, and but depending it, on kind of your level of advancedness, you probably actually prefer a control of the state file. Just mm -hmm. depending on how, you know, how deep in the weeds you are. Yeah, but also cloud formation uh, clearly figure out that they don't want to lose this game uh, so they came up with significant amount of features like drift detection, for example, where you can actually see that, oh, some of my resources have changed. Uh, I personally feel that the feature is good, 
but uh, implementation is not very natural. I mean, you have to do extra step in order to, to see what's wrong. In Terraform, it's quite natural. You just run apply and it run plan for you. Which is... So I completely agree with that, actually. So that's actually what Lona does. Lona runs a, a change set so you can see it, and it doesn't do the drift detection because, you know, that's a, a sync call that takes a while to kind of generate all that. Mm. But it actually does a diff, uh, but it does a diff more than just the, the diff of the, what's called the change set in CloudFormation. It changes, it does a diff of actually the different generated y, YML, essentially, so the code, too. Mm. And then it also does a diff of the parameters. Or in CloudFormation, they're called parameters. In, in, in Terraform, they're called variables. But actually, it tells you the different variables you're kind of applying to. That all gets kind of aggregated and summarized in just a Terraform plan. Mm. So Terraform, I think you're right. I think the workflow of Terraform plan is actually much smoother, especially with it's like there's no comparison if you compare the raw tooling there. But yeah. Lono, like I said, that framework makes it so it's a little bit up to par. But it's still not. I, I still think Terraform plan is actually provides a better uh, preview. Yeah. Cool. Uh, we have one more question, which I guess is the last one, uh, which is not answered. So uh, uh, the question is, uh, can Terra, sorry, can TerraSpace simplify cr creation of stacks in multiple environments in a single run? For example, create stacks in N regions in parallel. So with the way kind of the docs lay out, uh, it's not designed to do it that way. You have to actually call it twice. However, you could do whatever you want to do with Terraform, right? So if you want to have multiple regions, guess what you do? You wouldn't actually follow these conventions and these kind of defaults that TerraSpace would set up. Mm. You will actually shove into, guess what, a, a, a bigger module. And mm. then the bigger module will kind of handle that. So it kind of leaves it up to you, right? Because it's, it's configurable, right? So yeah. look at these configuration settings, right? it has all these different settings where you configure. So what I'm saying is you could use layering, but you could opt not to use it too. There is no mm. kind of, there's no like all, all command, I guess, like yeah. even a higher level command all that will loop through both of the uh, regions and then, or both accounts and then got, kind of deploy both accounts like that. Um, mm. Don't know if that will be created to be honest. Um, not sure. I'll have to sleep on that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's pretty uh, funny. Is that there are so many different ways and different solutions, which uh, like how we can solve these problems. And while you was talking about this from uh, TerraSpace, I was thinking how I would do this in, let's say, other tools or in native Terraform. And again, there are infinite amount of ways how you can do this. But the first way wh which naturally comes to my mind when I hear something when people say, "Hey, I want to do this, but across multiple things." Hey, we have we still have make files. We still have shell. If there are some things which uh, TerraSpace now cannot do for you, well, you write your own for reach and you run TerraSpace twenty times. Uh, <laughs> you can yeah, all. I think that might be the better approach. That's why I'm hesitant to say, hey, you know, is that something that it should handle? You know, uh, but you know. I mean, if it doesn't handle, just shove it all. Don't use a uh, region, right? Use global or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So there are, I mean, this is just an example of a uh, uh, solution. Again, I, I, I don't know uh, the best solution myself right now, but uh, in general, uh, the tool takes responsibility for combining Terraform project for you and run it for you in multiple combinations. Uh, I guess if we think, let's say, for five minutes, all of us can come up with situation where, oh, sorry, but TerraSpace, I cannot use TerraSpace in my pro in my project because it doesn't support this and this natively. <laughs> well, that's the same with all tools. So we yeah, and that might be a feature, right? Exactly. It's, it's by design to not uh, people uh, to not let people do crazy things. Too much rope, right? <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, it, it's, just, it's just something I struggle with because it's always a balance of trade-offs, mm. right? There's no elixir in the real world usually. You're right. And I have uh, one of last question uh, from myself, which is uh, actually, what is uh, your current plan about TerraSpace versus Lono versus many other projects which uh, you didn't talk about? But uh, I'm quite sure that uh, people who watch this stream, they will uh, go to your GitHub and learn about Jets and about a few other projects which you developed. 
so what what's your plan like are you going to abandon 10 years of work on lono or are you going to develop two things simultaneously what what's you your know, plan yeah that's definitely something i struggle with um software if you don't update it or rewrite it yourself somebody else can rewrite it that's just how it works right yep and that's the software world we, we live on kind of ground that always moves underneath our feet right so you know i actually would love to be able to take some of these concepts and eventually like basically upgrade some of those other tools mm -hmm. to kind of uh, to basically improve them right so i want to take a lot of terrace space concepts and put it into loan all that kind of stuff uh but there's only 24 hours in a day. Yep. So it's about priority, right? So maybe I can answer in terms of priority. Right now, my priority for me is currently terra space, mm -hmm. right? I want to get to the kind of the end of the finish line in terms of like features where I think it's like 80% of the way there so that, you know, it's kind of stable. Like for what's worth jets, it's kind of 80% of the way there. So people have been using it for a long time and it's fine. I do need to go back and kind of get Ruby 2.7 support kind of uh, adopted there. Mm -hmm. Um, Lono, I actually feel like I need to improve it a lot because I learned so much in doing TerraSpace. Mm -hmm. There were so many things in TerraSpace I did because of Lono. Mm -hmm. Because I was like, no, no, I, I, I took this shortcut here and I really regret that and I'm not going to do it this time in TerraSpace. Mm -hmm. And it turns out sometimes, even though it's counterintuitive, when you don't take shortcuts and you do it the harder way, you save time. Mm -hmm. Because I, I notice now that there's just a lot less kind of technical depth with terrace space than there is with Lono. So mm. I don't have to change like three or four files because the copy and paste duplication, I, I created, you know, the beast mm. I created myself. I was like, oh man. So I'm like, oh, I'm going to have to do that. Right. And, and Lono, I actually want, so I was at the cusp of finishing Lono bundle before mm. I wrote terrace space bundle. Right. So a lot of that code is kind of unfinished there. I want to go back. But right now I think with the business and everything, I'm basically be focused on terrace space. That's kind of where it seems to be the direction things are heading on mm -hmm. in terms of priority. I don't want to really want to say I want to give up on all those other tools yet, but yeah, if I if I don't do something about it, right, then yeah, eventually somebody else can rewrite it. And that's just the nature of the beast. Hopefully, mm -hmm. you know, there's more people that maybe want to contribute and like if they're interested and then like you know, then I'm more than happy to kind of review pull requests and and kind of you know and and consider them and all that. And I do that. I'm pretty rapid about that. Um, but yeah, there's only 24 hours a day. I think my party right now is probably terror space. Yeah, right. Yeah, that uh, sounds like a great plan and great, great vision, at least from my point of view. But uh, uh, then uh, do you have any, uh, like, f n not feedback, but any expectations or any help uh, which you want uh, from the community? Or w let's say, what are, let's say, top three things which you want people to, to do? Literally. I okay. mean, okay, subscribe yeah. to your YouTube channel, subscribe to your GitHub, follow you on Twitter. That's fine. This is uh, like step zero. Next. So that's step zero. Maybe star my project. Okay, like, yeah. Cool. <laughs> but anyway, um, so, I, you know, I think the main thing is uh, you are covered it. Like nobody really knows about Terra Space. You know, nobody knows what it does. Nobody knows what it's about. Uh, so use it, you know, I share with your friends and all that. I think that's important for the project to gain any traction and actually, to be honest, just motivate me mm. <laughs> There's comfort in numbers, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so that would be nice. Um, then maybe QA, right? Uh, the mm. more users you use it and, you know, the, the more users who are testing it, like you said earlier, hey, I got some beta testers, right? Yeah. I appreciate that. I appreciate that, and I, I, the reason I appreciate that is because most people don't like being in the position of being guinea pig, myself included. Mm -hmm. I usually like tools to be generally pretty stable before I start like messing around with them, right? But yeah. some people are okay with being guinea pigs and stuff like that, so you know, just go test out. And but for what's worth, I would say that I do a, a decent amount because I've written a lot of these different tools already, but I do a decent amount of QA. So, so whenever before I do a, a big release. All three cloud providers are tested with real resources, hmm. Azure, Google, and AWS. And what basically happens is I run a pipeline, I literally run a pipeline that uh, builds all three projects and then creates real resources, real hmm. physical resources, and then tears all down. I, I, I use hmm. actually the test framework to do that. I, 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 um, so what I'm saying is you're going to be, you could helpful, hopefully help by being like a guinea pig, but it's not gonna be that, it should not be that unstable. The baseline should be there, mm -hmm. and that integration build should kind of over the, you know, over time get more and more hardened, 
right? Mm. And then, uh, you know, just feedback generally, like, you know, if you have some questions and stuff, like, you know, like, you know, be sensitive to everybody's time, right? But this, you know, yeah. but just go there and ask some questions, things, about how you can prove it. You know, you know, be kind, come from a good place, yeah. <laughs> right? Um, but uh, yeah, just, you know, feedback is always appreciated, uh, especially constructive. If you're just like, you know, not constructive, then look, maybe not as much appreciated, right? <laughs> because here's the thing about the DevOps space, man. A lot of people just like, you know, so easy. Maybe it's not DevOps, maybe it's generally software because what we do is so hard, right? Mm. Like I tell my wife, I walk into the, the office, then to solve a problem that sometimes nobody's ever solved in the world, and I got to figure out. Mm. That's hard and mentally exhausting, so I get it, right? So, yeah. yeah, and maybe because of that, it comes off as sometimes like as a, you know, a big troll farm, right? Or, or just like a big like why Hawk Packer News like Playboy yeah. or whatever, right? Yeah, yeah so, absolutely. Yeah, so just, you know, be, be considerate, you know, and as hopefully more users kind of, you know, use it and everything. Hopefully everybody keeps that in mind. I really like Matt's, you know, Matt's the creator of Ruby, mm -hmm. you know, he's like, he's really well known for this. He's like, Matt's is nice, so everybody is nice. Yeah, I, mean, I kind of really like that. It's like, yeah, just yeah, just just be nice, you know, and then treat others as the way you want to be treated. Essentially. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's re really good. Uh, I would say final words for the today. I think today was the longest and the most uh, informative uh, session which we have ever had on this stream. So I, I'm really, really, really thank uh, you for your time and two hours of your life which you could have right in this framework you just spent on us <laughs> Dude, i appreciate you uh, and like yeah. I, I didn't get to show the demos and stuff which you whenever we could do whenever but like a lot of demos actually are using your modules like what you've done in the terraform community is like crazy uh and, like because writing terraform code takes a long time like it, it's it, it's mentally a lot of work yeah well, but it's the same as uh, with all other software development. Once you know how you do this, it's kind of fast. So, like, of course, when, when I started, it was harder. But then I figured out that, okay, it's actually a lot of fun. And I do this much faster than uh, before. So, uh, oh, yeah, there is last question uh, from uh, Jesus Malena. Or, yeah, Jesus, I guess. I see that TerraSpace deals with the top three cloud providers, but will OCI uh, be supported or be included? OCI is Oracle, right? Yeah, yeah, it's Oracle. Yeah, I think one day it will be included. I mean, it's I, I don't know where it is in the uh, kind of uh, pop popularity index, right? I think it's, it's number four. Is it number four? Oh, yeah. Oracle's cloud is number four. Oh, yeah. So I actually have, um, so there's, generators in TerraSpace, there's a generator that generates a plugin. Mm. And a plugin is a, a TerraSpace plugin, not a Terraform plugin. Mm. A, a TerraSpace plugin is essentially uh, the interface that's going to allow you to build kind of um, basically a support for uh, TerraSpace. Okay. So uh, I think I built like uh, AWS and then Google. And then for Zero, I was like, you know what? I'm repeating myself, so I'm going to build a there. <laughs> so Zero was actually generated and then uh, you still have to fill in the logic, right? It only gets you like generators only get you so far. It only get like 20 or 30% there. They get yeah. to actually build the, you know, the interface out. So at some point, maybe, um, to, to just to be a, a front prod, not the high of the party list right now. Um, but at some point, yeah. Well, I, nice. I guess you're also customer driven. So if there will be customer who come to you that we want to use TerraSpace with, uh, Oracle and, uh, we're going to pay you money. Uh, then you will probably say, okay, AWS is actually uh, on second place now. <laughs> yes, of course. Yes, that's how I got into TerraSpace. Right? Yes. <laughs> that's how I got into Terraform. A customer is like, we want Terraform. I'm like, okay, yep. sure. Yeah, it's. Uh, I, I see this pretty much everywhere. You don't have to explain. People, everyone understand that. Uh, yeah, if you're going to sponsor it, that's great. If you just want to request feature request, I will say thanks, but most likely we'll just put it in the like uh, drawer somewhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and see, like, because I'm so excited and passionate about these projects, that I was like, I was like, especially beginning, like, oh yeah, I'll do this, 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 and that. And then eventually you just get exhausted, right? So you just have yeah. to learn how to kind of balance that. And, and I, I'm not kind of used to saying that, like, oh no, I'm just gonna put it in my sock drawer or whatever, right? Yeah. But now I'm more kind of used to that. And for what's worth, I think it's healthier 
for for not just me, but because you know I created this project, it's healthier for overall the project, right? Mm. So so I appreciate what what you're saying exactly. Like I went through that. Like yeah. it's called open source exhaustion or something or burnout. Yeah, yeah. I think this is going to be a topic for the next uh, uh, session. Is the open source burnout <laughs> or how to abandon projects uh, in open source and still get paid for that? Yeah. That's a good topic. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's a dream. How to abandon everything and still get paid for that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> okay. Uh, again, uh, thanks a lot. And uh, Jesus just said, uh, thanks for answering my question. So, yeah. Uh, yeah thanks for having me. Uh, okay, on this note, uh, we are going to finish. And I will put a lot of information into, uh, into notes so people can find many of links which we were discussing today and uh, yeah remember to click whatever buttons you usually have to click like subscribe notification uh, following i mean you all guys know what to do thanks everyone okay bye